Um, all right, let's talk about this boring ass episode. <laughs> oh, this episode. This nothing episode. It's a nothing burger. That dares to end with hallelujah. I know, they did not do anything to earn their fucking hallelujah. No. It was like it was like one of those things where like the whole time I was like, okay, like fine, whatever. Like I'm watching this. It's like an episode of Criminal Minds, I guess. And then all of a sudden at the end, Gideon got like super like, I don't want this guy to die. And then he like dies. And then they're all walking around all sad with like hallelujah playing. And it's like what <laughs> like what? It, sort what? Of, it gave me the sort of whiplash that i imagine our listeners would get if i played a cover of hallelujah at the end of oh, our oh. podcast episodes i think <laughs> that it would be like a similar just absolute tonal whiplash this episode just ends with hallelujah <laughs> but here's like... the thing james is jay you would need to you would need to sing a cover of Hallelujah because there are no covers of Hallelujah that I could use that would not get us copyright stricken. I can so do I it. Need, like, yeah. <laughs> I've seen Shrek. I know the words. <laughs> How many times do you think I've seen Shrek? Because it's 10 times more than that. I know every word of that goddamn movie. Why? For And for what? <laughs> All right. And why is that your point of reference for Hallelujah? Because that's like... that really dramatic scene. Where, like, all of the fairytale creatures have, like, left his swamp and, like, Fiona's getting married. So he's, like, eating all alone. And it's, like, I heard there was a secret cord, you know? And Fiona's, like, wearing her wedding dress and she's, like, all sad about it. And, like, it's all dramatic. And it's, like, fucking Shrek. Shrek is cinema. Like, I'm I am saying that unironically. Like, please, as an adult, go watch Shrek. Because it is an amazing movie. Like, the musical... I mean, I like the musical, but it's dumb as hell. The sequels are, like, fine. The first Shrek movie is honestly a cinematic masterpiece. It is a masterclass in storytelling. And I'm, I'm not joking. Like, I'm not joking. I need you to know I'm being so serious. Shrek is a film. <laughs> it's not a movie, it's a film. <laughs> I'm serious. I know, I know you are, and I top 10 films ever made it's like schindler's list shrek (laughs) 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 but what is schindler's list (laughs) number two is shrek yeah our podcast goes up yeah, the, the, the Criminal Minds I dare you to leave this in. in. <laughs> I dare oh, you to no. leave my little Shrek montage in. That's gonna be the cold open to this episode. <laughs> we have better cold opens than fucking SNL now, because it's just Shrek. Hey, B, do you want to do a podcast called Wheels Up? About Criminal oh Minds? God. Jay, I would love to do a podcast about Wheels Up. I would love to talk about season one, episode 17, A Real Rain. Yeah. Which we'll talk about that quote when we get to it. Because um, I think I miss heard or it's very stupid uh, but we'll get there uh anyway um i feel like the last few weeks for us have been like a real journey because we had because we had like un we had like ride the lightning then unfinished, unfinished business, business the then tribe. the tribe which was Ugh. a whole episode <laughs> And now we have this one. This and I mediocre feel like... milk toast piece of shit. Yeah. That's how it's ending. Like, like for it better or for it. worse, there was a lot to talk about with like Ride the Lightning. There was a lot to talk about with Unfinished Business, with even the tribe. But then it's like this episode. And they went, you know, we had three big ones. People are still be talking about those. Let's just slip a little, just a little like, justice one in like here a, you know it's like a little dude just oh, i've got a guy. lot to, i've got a lot to say about what they consider justice in this fucking episode yeah there's a lot to get in here <laughs> i feel like <laughs> this episode is a nothing burger but there is one like shitty tomato on this nothing burger and that is everything they say about justice that's the only thing it's... that is on this nothing burger i do want to make like a quick like let's talk so let's talk about it real quick um 
I don't think this episode takes a stand one way or another on whether or not the killer is right. Correct. I think it, pre- it you know, quotation marks, presents um, both sides. And then it just, like, lets you decide, you know. Because, like, they end with those, you know, interviews of people being like, no, he was just a murderer. Or, like, yes, he did what we all wanted to do, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but, like, you know, so it's like people will take this different ways. And we're, like, leaving it up to you to decide what's right. But, like, I feel like the fact that they played Hallelujah, like, tells us how they feel about it, you know. They did that thing thing where they here's sort of what they did is they held up a they held up two pieces of paper one had the word go in red lettering and one had the word stop in green lettering and they were like but which one do you like but how do you know which one's right it's like obviously the one that says go you fucking dunce because that's how you presented it to me like (sighs) i want to take a quick moment to talk about storytelling and okay. this, I this, love this. This specific aspect of storytelling that I think gets overlooked a lot, particularly mm-hmm. in fandom spaces, but just in general. And it's that the story itself, the writers of the story have an opinion on the mm-hmm. events that happen in it. Right? So mm-hmm. in the episode, there are people that support the vigilante. There are people that condemn the vigilante. But the episode tells us how it wants us to feel and this happens in other in other shows right like Mm -hmm. somebody will make oh it happens it happens in criminal minds you know think of a time when um you know maybe read like will scream at one of the other members of the team and the show will very clearly be like this is read being out of line or this is Reed, you know, speaking his truth. And it's mm-hmm. like, it'll be the same situation, you know, both times it's Reed, but the way the episode has its characters react, the way the, the episode has consequences or not, you know, all of that tells us how the show itself wants us to feel about that particular incident. And I think mm-hmm. this episode, you know, they kind of, are trying not to do that, not to pick a side. But I think the fact that so much weight is given to the ending, the tragedy of his death, they could have saved him, like all this kind of stuff, like tells us that they really were on their side, you know? And and, Mm -hmm. and I, I could be convinced that it was more like he's mentally ill and they don't want to just like, well, he killed someone, so kill him. But it doesn't feel like that when you watch it. Yes, I think what is super important to remember about this episode of TV is that it is, in fact, an episode of TV. And it's not like it's just made in a vacuum for you to enjoy. Right. There are people who have opinions and intentions who made this thing. Yeah. And sure, some things might not, like, they might not have intended us to take X symbolism when they made JJ sit next to Reed on the plane. Sure, they might not have, but we're still going to read it like that because that's mm-hmm. how it looks. It's that same way of, like, sure, you might not have intended necessarily to take so strongly one side or the other in this whole justice versus law versus what's right versus what's wrong, whatever. But you still did. With the choices you made, you still, unintentionally maybe, but you still did actually make a point here. Even if your point was trying to display both sides and like... Right, not taking a stance is also taking a stance. Exactly, exactly. And so I think it's important to remember that, like, this is a TV show made by people and people have to make decisions to make this exist. Right. Nothing is on screen that was not on screen on purpose. Exactly. And sure, maybe it wasn't a very big decision. Maybe somebody was just like, sure, just throw those three at the table for blocking purposes. But, like, 
there was a decision made there. Yeah. There was a decision made to play Hallelujah at the end. And I'm yes. not sure it was a great decision. I'm not sure that was a great call, music supervisor. Um, but it's one that you made. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think it, this episode, and we'll talk about it when we get there, but this episode does say a lot about the police. It does. And I it feels like most of the time, or for most of the episode, there's like, a little bit of criticism. We can't tell the police that it could be a cop or they will stop helping us. Helping us. Like there's mm-hmm. like that. But then like somebody else kills a cop and suddenly it's like, okay, now we really have to find this guy. Yeah. You know? And then I, I think one thing interesting thing the ending does do is it does put the cops and the BAU on either side of this, Mm -hmm. this, you know, either side of of supporting this guy, right? Where Gideon and Hotch and them want to protect him. They want to help him get better, et cetera, et cetera. And then Tanya Pinkins, who we will talk about, love of my life, Tanya Pinkins, the Mm -hmm. police chief, um, is like, fuck you. I've got a fucking sniper on the roof. I'm going to kill this man, you know? And there are other episodes, like it derailed, there's a sniper and Hotch is like, if you get a shot, fucking take it, you know? So it's like, why this guy? Why this guy? Why right now? Yeah. And then in the end, Hotch is the one who shoots him anyway. No, the sniper shoots him. No, I thought the gun smoke no. coming off of his gun is what meant that he'd shot him. No, no, I'm pretty sure it's a sniper because remember the guy, the 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 um Ted Elmore falls to the side and Tanya Pinkins says do you have a shot? And it looks like the guy is pointing his gun at Gideon. And then I need to go back to the angles. Cause I think the angles trick me there because I think he got shot like directly in the front chest. By Hodge? By Hodge. I think that was it. Oh, I really assumed it was the sniper. No, let me go. We can, we can start talking about the episode and I'll go okay, back. I'll start and while I'll you look at do it. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're, we're going to Manhattan. It's nighttime, New York, Manhattan, raining um, in the apartment above a store. A shirtless man is rocking in his chair and you hear people whispering like murder, guilt, abuse. Um, Vague. It's very weird way to start an episode. This one had weird vibes from the get. Yeah, I got really afraid for a moment that this was the fucking bread in the bullet room episode. Oh God, no! Although um, I actually do like that episode a lot, and I'm sorry. No, it's no, it's a, it's that. a fi- it's a fine episode. But I was like, is this the day <laughs> I have to watch that happen? Is it today? <laughs> um, it was not. It's um, not and, today. Yeah, no. He tuck. He tapes like it looks like aluminum foil, but I think it's like the air conditioning. Um, you know those like filters. I think it's like that material. God, I can't think of the fucking word. Um. Oh goodness, like that air conditioning filter that's like f- fluffy. Um. Oh, you know what like I'm talking insulation about? Insulation, kind insulation. of insulation. I think he's sticking insulation and then duct putting foil over it and duct taping it because yeah, just foil over of- a window would not. Sound make it sound anything yeah yeah i think later in the episode they when they go into his apartment yeah. they peel it back and it's like soundproofing it's like or like insulation yeah yeah um interesting you know smart guy it apparently worked um so he's dressed in like a hood and he goes out into the streets in the rain he's got like twitchy fingers and we don't know what that means yeah he's just got twitchy fingers um and he's like in the taxi and while he's driving they like make the taxi driver look like the creep you know, for a minute, he's, like, being all creepy and sketchy. Um, and then he just, like, tries to start conversation yeah. so hard. This yeah. guy makes such an effort to, like, like try sports, and chat. Sports, like, hey, you a Knicks talk. fan? You yeah. know? Oh, goodness. Uh, the guy does not answer. And the ta- they get to the location, and it's this, like, weird, like, under overpass, like, under the overpass. Um, the-, the guy is like, is this where you want me to drop you off? It's like the middle of the night and it's raining like okay and then the guy goes around to the front window and just like shoots him in the i wrote shoots him in the face because that's what it looks like but it that's later turns out to be the like. chest yeah. yeah um yeah and so then we cut to the bayou the taxi driver is walter Durbin from east harlem 
JJ is like taking notes in her file. And I was like, you know this. Like, you did <laughs> this. You, you made that this. For? You made that You're file. The one... <laughs> yeah. You're the one who put together this PowerPoint presentation. Why are yeah. you taking notes? And then like two seconds later, she starts talking about the case. So I was like, I was like, they were just like, AJ Cook looked busy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have her phone to be texting on. So she was like, yes. fuck it. I guess I'll just take some notes now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so when they find the taxi driver, he's blindfolded. He's been shot twice in the de- chest, but the cause of death is a wife wound. They say behind his ear, but after this, it's in, in his ear. ear. Also, I don't know if I'm just tired and misheard, but I think you just said wife wound instead of knife wound. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> knife wound. So true, knife wife. Let's go. Wife knife. <laughs> <laughs> Wife Knife is actually yeah. my uh, superhero name. <laughs> are you a married person who uses knives or are you married to the knife? <laughs> I think my shtick is that I give knives to wives who want to kill their abusive husbands. I think that's my thing. So true, queen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my thing. And if I happen to find gay love along the way, then that's just how it is, you know? Fuck yeah. I'm just saying <laughs> Real marriage is between two knives. <laughs> <laughs> the knives were the wives all along. <laughs> we are 20 minutes into this episode and God. already so off the rails. <laughs> we started with the, I started with a Shrek monologue. Like, where were we going <laughs> to go from we there? Had, we were never on the rails. No. All right. Oh, I did make a note about the office, the setup of like where they're sitting and, and stuff. This room finally feels like big. They finally figured out how they wanted to the like conference yeah, like, room. Yeah, like the angle of it, or they had a bigger room or something. But it felt like there was space to fucking breathe in there. Before it was like this <laughs> tiny closet, truly a small table room, and now it's um, it felt like I could they could breathe. So I have that Hodges right standing presenting. JJ's like in a chair just like in space like she's not at the table she's just like away slightly back from the table just yeah. hanging out <laughs> yeah um Gideon is sitting in the row of chairs along the wall which he stops doing at some point I think I should um, hope so it's fucking obnoxious I know and then um Reed Morgan and L are at the table um yeah like so, the good kids they are actually like the sitting kids. at the table for its intended I fucking know. purpose cough was- cough JJ's that, that kid who's like, I'm presenting next. I, I need to be close to the board. I just need to be ready when they tell me it's my turn to talk. Like, <laughs> that's what JJ's doing in this episode. <laughs> so true. Uh, rather Victorian. All right. Okay, this murder has the same signature as two other murders, but it's different locations and different victimology. Um, there are no leads. It's always at night. The guy's like a ghost. There's no witnesses. Yada, yada, yada. Um... So the NYPD has held information from the press, so they um don't know like the obvious link. And then Reed compares this guy to the Zodiac and was like, he got away for with it for like 30 years. Um, I wrote bum bum bum. Like they're worried this guy's gonna do this for 30 years. But it takes like a like a single day, like two full days to solve this case. <laughs> They only, yeah, I liked how Gideon, Gideon here was like such a pessimist of like, you know, and the fucking, the Zodiac continued for 30 years. And then he's like, it takes them three days to catch this guy. Like, hey, have a little more faith in yourself, buckaroo. Why is Come it on, this, buck up. Why isn't this team trying to solve the fucking Zodiac? They could, <laughs> I mean, apparently it wouldn't be that fucking hard for them. A tenth of the time. Um, all right. So then we see the New York skyline behind the plane. Ooh, how cool. Um, I wrote Derek's huge jacket. He has a huge jacket on that plane. It's like a <laughs> suit does. jacket, but it's like, it's like, bam, big. <laughs> it's a really large overcoat. And I don't know yeah. why he keeps it on like later in this episode too. I'm like, that jacket is much too large to be comfortable <sighs> they to just move need to around cut, in. They just need to cut the fucking muscle shirt, Derek, and quit it with this suit <laughs> I know. Nonsense. Who is this Give man? muscle shirt and like, sometimes he wears a nice polo. I'm very into that, Derek, please. Yes, yes, yes. 
Oh, when Derek starts wearing like his dark colored button downs with like the Ooh. sleeves rolled up. That's season like yes. five or six. He starts wearing button downs again, but like hot this time. <laughs> oh, love that for us. All right. Um, it's something oh, yeah. to look forward to. It's really just like the little <laughs> things that we're trying to use to get ourselves through <sighs> how much of a shit show this first these first few seasons are. So we see the New York backdrop. Immediately, Elle is like, so happy to go back to where I'm from, and that's New York City. <laughs> like, immediately. It's like, this um, is not how I imagined spending a few days back home. Yeah. Uh, JJ is like, man, I wish we had the afternoon off so I could go to Barney's. And she says El Cantinari, but it's spelled Il Cantinari. It's like an Italian restaurant, but she mispronounces it. She says it's so white. And I was like, yeah, I was like, JJ, my love. Please stop it. You're from Pennsylvania. We get you're from, it. You're from Podunk, Pennsylvania. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, your town wasn't big enough for a bowling alley, babe. Like, don't. Uh, also, but but uh, but also, we know that she not yet, but like I know that she took Spanish in high school. So, she should like, have a slightly better grasp on Italian. Yeah, exactly. They're the same romantic language. They have the same sort of base, except. Italian's a little more flowy, but yeah. Yeah, but like El Continari. Like, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Anyway, I just thought it was okay. cute. I know. I just thought it was cute that she had this, like, like, if I was in New York for fun, I would go shopping, and I'd go to this, like, very cool Italian restaurant, and she, like, looks at Elle, like, yeah? <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> I was like, oh, baby. I love how she's just, like, Somebody take me on a date for an afternoon to New York. She's like, if someone could just like <laughs> think I'm cute and take me out, that'd be very nice. <laughs> I mean, if she's like, could she's hold like my bags 20... while I'm shopping, please and thank you. She's like 26, 27. Like, that's fucking insane. She's a, she's so young. Like, I know we talk about, like, Reed's 24, right? We saw his 24th birthday. She's, she is not that much older than he is. Yeah. And that, that is going to come up. Mid season two, got a lot of thoughts about that, but I think like I think in this beginning that they still tried to like show that she was young. You young. Know. I'm gonna she's call her a kid to because fun. she's she's my age, and I do like to think I'm not an old person at 27. All right, <clears throat> Reed has never been to New York City because they've never had a New York City on some. Okay. Uh huh. Two parts to this. Yeah. One one Reed. What the fuck go what to new fuck? york city you live in dc even i've been We're to so new close. york city right and i'm from fucking iowa like right you have no excuse reed yeah um and two the being you in the like four years reed has been there has never had an unsub in new york city one of the fucking like crime capitals of our country <laughs> and like after this they go back to new york city like once a season ish yes about they go there fairly frequently. Ugh, come on. Come on, Reed. It's come like, on, they always have their, like, one, one, like, episode a season of New York, of LA, and then for some reason in, like, mm-hmm. five, seven, five through nine, they go to Kansas City a whole bunch for some yeah. truly terrifying cases. I do like, Hodge leans over to Gideon and says, you should make Reed take a vacation. And Gideon goes, what's a vacation? And then just, like, stares at him. And Hodge is like, Okay. <laughs> hey, everybody, if you have PTO, take it. Take it. Take your fucking paid time off. If you yeah. can take a vacation, take it. Yeah. Even if you don't go anywhere, just fucking take a vacation to not go to work sometimes. Staycation. Staycations are fun. Derek is like, it's only a one hour flight. It's only a three hour train ride. And then JJ offers to show Reed around if they have time after the case. And I was like, you know, speaking of choices to have them sit next to each other, I was like, this is cute. Like I don't ship it. Like they feel very like okay. We're doing a brother sister thing now. But it was yeah. like a but it was like a cute like all the kids sit next to each other and play cards, which they do again and again. Yeah, they play cards. They play cards on the plane a whole bunch. JJ is the only person who can beat Reed at cards, which I love. <laughs> which I love, and that comes up several times. Um, he's like, "I'm from Vegas." When other people like, when he like wins, he's like, "Haha, I'm from Vegas." But then JJ does win several times. Um, we should also mention how they're sort of like sitting on the plane. It's yeah. It's JJ, Reed, L, 
playing cards. Yeah, they're like in one of those, you know, four chairs, table in the middle. At the table. And then Derek's just hanging out. He's just doing, hanging out in his big coat. <laughs> he's doing the thing where he like sits on the arm of the couch to be like parallel to the table. Yeah. Even though there is an empty seat. Elle said, no one sits next to me. <laughs> Elle says, Elle says I'm just, you this get is over for there. my coat. This is for my coat and purse, actually. You can my, hang out over there. This is my, my bag is sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Derek. <laughs> yeah, that's Elle. Uh, and then Hodge and Gideon are like on the end of the couch, like sitting next to each other talking about work. They finally, Hotch is like, all right, let's talk about our fucking job. And then, which I love. I also thought it was interesting. Most of the time we start with them talking about the case and then they break off to do fun things. And in this episode, they start, they're already in the middle of a card game when Hotch is like, all right, come on, like, let's talk. I thought that was cute. They're like, no, let's hang out like first. That. Especially because it is, as they've mentioned, a one hour plane flight. It's not a very long flight. No, so Hotch is like, yeah, go ahead, have some fun, real powwow, five minutes before we land. Like, it's a one-hour flight. It's also just like, I don't know, to me, that's like, the implications of what happens as they first get onto the plane is always so interesting to me, of like, how does everybody choose where they sit, or what they're doing, or who's presenting the case, or like, Mm -hmm. who starts up the laptop so they can talk to Garcia, um, I like the implication of this, of them playing cards first, is that the kids were already playing cards when Hotch got on the plane and they left. <laughs> and they kept and their they hands. Like, they were like, actually, we're just going to finish this game if you don't mind. And Hotch is like, okay, sure. <laughs> okay, fine. Elle, JJ, and Reed are like all surrounding Reed's desk playing cards. And Hotch is like, come on, wheels up. We got a case. So they just like put their hands in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and they gather their things and everyone gets on the ki- the plane and then they like sit and pull their cards out and continue. Playing. <laughs> I really enjoy that as as fact. I really just like it of like, we're gonna finish this game, by the way, if you don't mind. Yes. I know there's a serial killer, but we're gonna finish this this card. <laughs> Nothing game. we can do from the plane. Like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so fucking funny. All right. Hotch, get down to business. It's a blitz attack. They think it's a blitz attack um random all that kind of stuff must be mo- it's mostly men who do blitz attacks mm-hmm. Derek says he is he's not a brother uh because he does get a taxi in the middle of the night in the rain which is so true which I was like good for you Derek you should <laughs> so and you true, should Derek. say it <laughs> it's true and you should say it and then Al like looks at him and like laughs and then they were like the two people of color on the plane, you know? I'm like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'd love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Reed says he has to be highly intelligent. L says that blitz attackers are textbook disorganized. And I'm just like, but he brings his kid along. Uh, they agree to split up. And then they're like, why does he blindfold them? Like, why is he like trying to avoid attention? Like, this isn't stuff that like blitz, attack- blitz attackers do. Um and then they said he probably blindfolds him because of remorse. It's usually a sign of remorse. Mm-hmm. I don't think that comes up again. Like the blindfolding does, you know, because we get a few more victims. But like the remorse aspect of it, they don't really explore that very much. They really don't, actually. I mean, like there's... You know, they they vindictive isn't the right word, but it's a very much like they did something wrong, so I have to kill them. If I kill them, the voices will stop. You know, there's not really any, like, he doesn't seem to be remorseful about any of it. Even when that one kid is, like, in his arms, the victim is like, I have to do this. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. He never is like, I'm sorry, but I have to do this, you know? Yeah. This is, I think, another one of those early criminal minds things that they do where they just say a lot of things and then they discard pretty much all of it. Yeah. And, And they... Do, but it's like sometimes they discard it like they do with the blitz thing later they're like he's not a blitz attacker mm-hmm. we were wrong about that so they do sometimes like that they'll admit they were wrong they change the profile but sometimes they just like drop it not a big deal it's whatever it's whatever it really feels like so you know how so a lot a lot of crime writers a lot of authors who write fiction about crime mm-hmm often will say that they what they start with is like the crime and then they work backwards to see how each piece needs to be discovered Mm -hmm. to be caught right criminal minds feels like they start at the beginning and they end up with a crime 
yeah. you know, like, like the, here's our profile on the plane. They have the plane conversation. And then halfway through the episode, they're like, oh, this doesn't fit. Okay, well, we were wrong about the Blitz attack. Like, it, it doesn't look like it's going to go that way. And then by the end of the episode, they have, like, they write, you know, it's like they have a profile. And then they create a criminal that will fit that profile. That's yeah. how I feel like the episodes are written. Like, it's not like, here's our criminal, let's profile him and spread that through an episode. It's more like, here's the profile of the killer. What does he have to be doing at the end to match that, you know? I don't think it's necessarily always bad. Sometimes, I mean, there are some good episodes of this show that I genuinely am like, yeah, this show oh, is shit, good. Bruh. Yeah, but sometimes I'm just like, oh, so you like lost your sticky note with your profile <laughs> on it halfway through writing this episode or what? <laughs> you know (laughs) it's funny that you say that because i have one sticky note for this episode as well i have one note to say wow and i do have ten and a half pages again this is just how we this is just how it goes jay don't worry about it yeah all right it's fine um okay we cut to the crime scene gideon is wearing a leather jacket made a note about that weird uh and reed is there they meet the police chief of the precinct and it's tanya fucking pinkins okay one of my favorite musicals of all time is Carolina Change. And Tanya Pinkins plays the lead character, Caroline. And oh my goodness, I am obsessed with that musical. I listen to it constantly. My like, when I'm having a panic attack, my like calm down song that I like sing to myself to help me like center myself is from fucking Carolina Change. It's one of her songs. Like all this stuff. She showed up on my screen looking hot as fuck. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> yeah no i like women i do enjoy women um <laughs> she's great i think she's great in this episode she's so fun in this episode i was actually gonna make yeah. a note of that i like their supporting characters this episode i think they're yeah. really interesting yeah it feels more fleshed out than usual you know we we've said and we talked about this a lot early on and i think in the first episode that we really liked the characters of the show you know mm-hmm. and i think that it's the characters of the show that make this show a success you mm-hmm. know um and sometimes they have supporting characters that you like do not remember later and sometimes you watch the episode and you're like i want to know about them yeah i want to know about what detective bennett's story is like yes. what's her deal yes i love her love her she also just looks you're right she just looks hot this episode she's just so hot she is like thank god our first milf of the show <laughs> I like how you're assigning her MILF status. I am. And you know what? As is your right to do so. Continue. Thank you so much. The Metro doesn't even stop at this stop at that time of night. Mm-hmm. Um, And so, like, there wouldn't have been people coming and going. No one would have seen them. So, like, they're like, okay, he must have known that. The onset must have known that beforehand. Mm-hmm. Because... um. He, the he building him drive him here yeah like you know? the building nearby is abandoned so there was no reason to be there yeah. the train goes express at that time yeah like... so like he must have known beforehand um they look at the last stop for the taxi and it's church street and tanya pinkins says that it's the only entry point for brooklyn no it's not the only one it's the entry point for brooklyn and there's a dive bar there that the cabbies go to Mm -hmm. So, like, he knew that, and that's where he was picked up. So he, like, went to this bar where he knew there would be cabbies. Um, And so that's when they decide, like, he's not disorganized after all, which is what then leads them later to him not being a blitz killer. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, Derek and Elle go to Rachel's home. Rachel is one of the two previous victims. They do not talk about the other previous victim at all. They really they, do not. They say what he does. I think it was like he killed someone drunk driving. Yeah. And then he was found murdered at his like paint studio. Yeah. And I do remember one thing they say about him. They were like, he was a drunk driver. That could happen to anyone. Which? Like anyone could be a drunk driver. Which like logically, like sure. But also like, no. No. It's a type of person that chooses to get behind the wheel of a car drunk exactly in new york city when there are plenty of alternatives you know so i don't i don't like that they were like well that was not a big deal 
Like, no. yeah, they were like, it's whatever. You know, people drive drunk. It's like, no, no, we don't have to. No, we, we really don't. Friends don't let we friends don't. drive drunk. Especially because Garcia just made that fucking joke. I guess yeah, friends literally. let friends drive drunk back then. But now, like, whatever. It's no people do that. It's fine. It can happen to anybody. Uh, also, weren't Garcia's parents, like, literally killed by a drunk driver? Yeah. They were. Something like that, I think, yeah. They were, like, out looking for her, and they did get killed by a drunk driver. But, like, oh, friends let friends drive drunk back then. She didn't have that backstory yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's not the kind of shit you say when you've got a backstory like that. All right. Anyway, they go to, so they go to Rachel's home. Rachel was a drug addict. Um, I think I wrote down what she was. She was charged with, like, fatally in- injecting her boyfriend with heroin, and right. then also like cocaine possession is what she actually right. got like indicted for, but the, or right. like she got, and it got dis- that's the one that stuck, but the heroin one did not. Not when she right. was innocent. Um, and they treat this oddly in this episode. Her, like, yeah. like they say she got off because. People say addiction, addiction is a disease, blah, blah, blah. But they say it like that. Well, specifically, later on when we get to the reporter, Lance Wagner, he's right. the one who says it and nobody bothers to correct him. So it just sort of stands. And you're yeah. like, that's weird. But then here at this part of the episode, they're like, oh, yeah, she was change of address card, like yeah, they list said of she... AA meetings in the area. She's turning yeah. over a new leaf. Good for her. Also, she's dead now. <laughs> yeah, it's like she hadn't even she hadn't even filed her change of address. Yeah. Um, she didn't know her neighbors, so they wouldn't have checked on her. Again, the thing with the neighbors and the checking. I don't know. I don't think my neighbors would. I know them. We wave. We've said hello. I do not think they would ever be like, oh, I haven't seen them in a while. And, like, knock on my door. Like, it's none of their fucking business what I'm doing with my life. Um, maybe it's different in an apartment. No, not no, really. No, it wasn't at my old apartment. Yeah. Because I'm thinking, like, the Midwest is notoriously known for how friendly it is. I don't know my fucking neighbors. When I live in an apartment building, I think that if I if we had died, it would have been the smell. It would not have yeah. been, like, I haven't heard them coming or going recently, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, she was so. She was in AA. AA. Which... She should have been in N.A. Yes. But they, whatever. So A.A. Hostess, has more recognizable branding, I guess. I guess. More name it, recognition in is probably honestly I, it. Yeah. Or 2006 at this point. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, so Hotch's theory is like the answer broke in. It's a, oh, Hotch says the police's theory is that the answer broke in and surprised her. But, you know, and the shot um, came from within the apartment. Uh, and she ran before she could be stabbed. So he was like, actually, I think that she let him in. And Or he, he was, no, he was already in there. Right. There's a hallway without scary. any windows. And he was waiting there. And when she came, he, she came in, he shot her to subdue her. And then he, he did the flint knife through the ear um, and then broke the handle off. And Elle says the ear is like the softest way to your brain. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's Derek who says um, in prisons, when they do prison shankings, they break the handle because then you can't pull the blade out. Mm -hmm. Um, Reed suggests a serial killer groupie. Um, Who's like, yeah, they're like, this is also a, this has also been used for, or he'd been used by other famous serial killers who have done mm-hmm. this. So he must have so studied. The police yeah. are like, okay, so is this like a weirdo with an Amazon account? <laughs> Which is something weird to say in 2006. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon does not teach you anything. Amazon's just a mega corporation. <laughs> like, maybe they meant like buying books about I serial guess. killers. I don't know. Oh, also, they... support your local indie bookstores. <laughs> instead yeah. of if you find what you want on Amazon, see who's selling it, go to their website and buy it from them. Literally. Literally. Um, Amazon's a great search engine for products. Really Don't gotta is. buy it from them. <laughs> um, okay. I do like what they do here. They give the profile simultaneously, but it's cutting between Gideon and Tanya Pinkins and 
the people in the apartment to the police. Mm-hmm. Like they're giving them simultaneously and being like, this is a guide, a guideline. So they're like, we think he shoots them first to control them because he can't overcome them. So he's either physically small or um, unconfident. Unconfident? Or not confident? Inconfident? Incompetent? No, it's, what are you it's, it's, to say here? it's the negative of confident. But what's the prefix? Unconfident? Yes. Oh, I don't know why that sounds so bad to me right now. Whatever. Um, okay. Gideon, now we have a whole new profile that's completely different from what we're, we had on the plane. He, The guy is highly organized, maybe with a day job. Um, and then we cut to the police precinct. And they're, like, joking around. Uh, oh, it, might, it must be you. It could be you. Whatever. Um, it's not a blitz attack because these are planned executions. And he has a signature. And they explain that a signature... Um, is used to satisfy a killer's need via ritual. Yeah, and Reed talks about how even though they, even though a killer is always trying to reach a specific fantasy, or serial killers are trying to reach a specific fantasy, uh, that will never live up to their expectations, mm-hmm. so they will just constantly kill. Yeah, they won't. this guy won't stop until we catch them. Um... We get a very nice Agent Juro we spoke on the phone. Uh, Wonderful. And then JJ reiterates that we cannot have leaks. She's like, I told the policeman, no leaks at all. It's very important. But then she asks um, Tanya Pinkins to to also say it to them. She's like, it might be Yeah, she's like, it wouldn't hurt coming from you too. Yeah. Um, And then they're like, if it gets out it could cause terror like the son of sam i love that they this is my one sticky note by the way i love that every single new york episode they're like this could cause terror like new york hasn't seen since the son of sam (laughs) it's like every single new york episode that's the only new york serial killer they bothered to look up (laughs) so fucking funny yeah um okay so we cut to church there's an older woman there the guy is all twitchy and shit in the doorway. And the woman is like, can I help you? Do you need some help? Like, what's going on? Uh, and then she leaves. And then he doses himself with the holy water. He does his thing. He goes into the confessional. And the priest, like, looks at him. And then he just, like, shoots the priest, like, through the confessional, like, barrier. Again, yeah. it looks like he's just shooting him in the face. Uh, but no. Uh, yeah. It's for dramatic effects, James. Come on. Oh, yeah, Jay, come on. So, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, the night janitor found the priest and remembered that there had been a parishioner there, which was the old woman. So they get her to come back. Uh, this is the guy's first public killing. It's like the same method. So they're like, it's about the presentation. Like the presentation really matters. Um, Derek and Al go to talk to the woman. She's like, I'm settled. She's like, it's my fault. Like I saw him. I should have stopped him. But it was, it was like he didn't hear me. And then she mentions like the Trishy hands, like he was playing the piano. Oh my god! <laughs> and then Reed goes to the ME, and he gets so close to the fucking ME. And this the ME poor is like, ME. And the ME is just like side eyeing him so hard. Reed is so close to him, and then Reed is like, "Hey, can you uh pull out that thing that's in his ear?" And the ME is like, "Yeah." I guess. The Emmy does not say a word, just sighs no. dramatically yes. multiple times. Ugh. And I think that's so fucking funny. It made me laugh out loud that Reed was straight up like, I have to be fully pressed to this Emmy. And then I and then when he's really uncomfortable, I will ask him for a favor. It was like, uh, Reed, my boy. <laughs> Reed cannot he cannot comprehend body language and you know this because of any reasonable person on earth would have stopped after the first dramatic sigh from this Emmy. But it's also like Reed's thing we see it time and again is that he doesn't like physical contact. You know, yeah. he like only accepts hugs from people he really cares for, that he trusts. He like doesn't like shaking hands, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But he like fully koalas up on this Emmy. <laughs> he is like backpacking on this dude yeah it was like one of those things where i was like okay we are being told again that reed lacks social awareness he can't read body language he can't read um other people's nonverbal cues 
but they do it in a way that is opposite of how they have characterized Reed. Yeah. You know, so that's a little I think they just didn't have his characterized. They didn't have his, like, sheet of they were like, personality he's, traits he's, down yet. He's socially awkward, you know. That just means he's he does whatever. Yeah, Sprinkle they it in how you, how you want. Yeah, they haven't given him any, like, clearly defined um, things that he dislikes yet, you know. He's mm-hmm. just, like, bad at social stuff, I guess. Um, all but right. they also did have the handshake thing earlier, so they, like, kind of st- were starting to figure it out. I think they just probably on set were like, it would be so funny if. And they just did it, you know? Yeah, fair. And they can do that because he, like, isn't canon anything. They can just be like, yeah, he's awkward. It'd be so funny if he was just yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, you're right, it would be. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. You find out that the, this rector was indicted for pedophilia and he was cleared of the charges, but he lost a bunch of his congregation after that. But, like, the woman was like, I mean, he was found innocent in court. Like, that's, that's the way she it. says it. The way she says it is actually really interesting. Yeah. And I want to say, I do like this lady because she does feel like every elderly woman who goes to a Catholic church ever. Yes. No offense to elderly women who go to Catholic church, but sometimes there's just like that thing and you're like, oh yeah, you really did do this. But she's just like, he was cleared in a court of law. Who am I to question that? Yeah. Which I love the wording of that. Who am I to question the court of law? Like, you know, that's the biggest thing above all. It's the law, right? Says someone who's like never had the court system work against them. Exactly. I like it in this case. And I also like it because it's sort of, to me, this is the first really indication that we get of like law versus justice. Mm -hmm. Because she's like, he was declared innocent in a court of law. She doesn't make any indication of if she agrees with it or not, or if she thinks it's true. Obviously, she, like, thought it was good because she's still here. But the way that she, like, number one, mentions it so easily to these agents, and then number two is, like, who am I to question the law? Yeah. I mean, we could put a really, really, like, you know, metatextual reading on it and say, like, she's obviously been his parishioner for a long time. So when he got indicted of pedophilia, like she you know didn't see it didn't notice not like i'm not blaming him saying like you know the things that go through your Mm -hmm. head when you find out someone you know and trust has done bad things you know so for her it's like well he was cleared so he didn't do it so there was nothing i didn't miss anything yeah yeah you know so it feels very much like that um Mm -hmm. especially the way she's like talking about this guy she was like, I should have done something. Like, he was right there. I should have stopped him. She, like, says that about this guy, you know, and then is quick to defend still going to this church because he was found cleared. Like, he didn't he didn't do anything. I There wasn't anything for me to stop, you know. <laughs> Watch me read into this one scene character so hard. This is what we have to do when this episode is a nothing burger. It's a nothing do you see burger. what you make us do, Criminal Minds writers? Criminal Minds. Do you see? People, people on Tumblr are like, you project so hard onto JJ. If this is how hard I project onto one scene characters, how, yes, I project so hard onto the main ones. Duh. The flint knife, Gideon says it's for retribution. Uh, and then they look at the blindfold and they realize that all of the blood is on the inside. It's on the guy's face and the blindfold was placed on top after he was dead. Um, Yikes. They, yeah, I don't think that comes to anything. I don't well, no, think it they... does in the way that, like, they know that he wasn't blindfolded to begin with. And so they kind of get to rule out he's, it's not because of, like, oh, was it to, like or to, yeah. like, protect his identity. It's just because this is how he wants to ritual. display these people. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Um, Hotch calls Garcia and asks for the victim's criminal record to see if he had a criminal record, uh, which we know that he did. But, all right. Uh, oh, no, he asks for all the other victims' criminal records. So this is where we find out that that one guy was um, vehicular manslaughter. And then the Rachel was um, convicted, or she was charged with cocaine possession and the fatal dose of heroin, but cleared of it. She and then the- only, no, she was only convicted for the cocaine possession. She was right. convicted. Okay, but not, just right, because she went to the, prison and stuff. Not um, for yeah. the, not for the, like, death. I guess, federal crime or whatever, the higher level of crime of, like, the death. 
right cocaine possess drug possession versus administration Murder. of fatal yeah. substance yeah um and then the taxi driver was uh spousal battery fuck that guy i, know, I love how they all take a moment to say fuck this dude yeah, like, they were like, oh. Penelope takes a moment is like, wow, what a fucking dick. Like, later, <laughs> yeah. everybody else takes a moment to be like, wow, what a fucking dick. I know. Something that, like, rubbed me the wrong way about the girl, the woman victim, the uh, drug user addict. Her boyfriend was also a drug addict. And that's something that's never brought up. Like, everyone's entirely focused on the fact that she gave him a fatal dose when... Yeah. When, like, if this was really about, like, about, I don't know, cleaning the streets, then, like, wouldn't her, like, this guy kills her for essentially being a drug addict, but she killed her boyfriend, also a drug addict. So, like, I just would have liked some nuanced look into that. I would have loved a more nuanced look into the sort of conversation point that the reporter brings up of like addiction is a disease. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, this was 2006 in a primetime drama show on CBS. War Against Drugs. Yeah, exactly. Hey, that's so cool. Hey, in case you can't tell <laughs> by your voice, it wasn't cool. No, it was very bad. We have a new profile. It's a vigilante. He shoots it's a con- vigilante, baby. I love how they have a fun name for it like ew, a vigilante, vigilante. <laughs> yeah exactly ew. he keeps someone who keeps vigil um he shoots to control he stabs for killing and also for symbolism and then he blindfolds them like lady justice that's the significance of the blindfold they decide um i do we... like how they show this the blindfold thing later in the Wouldn't... later in the show there's a there's a shot we'll oh. get to it later when they We'll get to it later. There's a, there's a cool thing of like Lady oh. Justice being blindfolded in the corner. Oh my god, I literally just made that connection. That's what he stares at all day. They pan yes. from the court stenographer to the like painting. directly across him. Oh. He was literally just staring at the blindfolded Lady Justice all day. Yeah, you're so right. I literally did not make that connection. I was like, why do they keep showing us this painting? Why all is right. this painting so significant? It's because it's justice, baby. Literally a blindfolded Lady Justice. All right. Reed says that serial vigilantes are rare. Um, it's most likely that the victim was, um, that the unsub was a victim of a crime or that somebody close to them was a victim of a crime. Um, they probably had somebody close to them killed and the victims are stand-ins for that person that hurt their loved one. Mm-hmm. Um, they probably work in or around criminal justice, someone like a judge, a bailiff, or a paralegal. Uh, and then... They're going to cross-reference unsolved assault murder cases. Um, They describe him as he's like a cog in the machine, not noticed, and then he likes theatrics because it gets attention. And then they do a terrible green screen of all the victims' faces. And then our girl... The whole green screen bit that they did when they were talking about this dude was so... It's not good. In fact, it's not bad. good, gang. Not good. The effects, not great. Not great. Okay. And then JJ comes in with like the newspaper and she's like, it's on the front page. <laughs> bing, bing, boom. All right. Okay. So next we cut to the Chinese restaurant scene, which is adorable. I love this scene so much. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, before we talk about the profile stuff, let's talk about the fun stuff. Um, it's such a good scene. There, it's so good. It's mm-hmm. like and so the seating arrangement. I'm pretty sure is like Hotch, Reed, JJ, Morgan, Gideon, L. I think, which is adorable. But again, they have JJ and Reed doing this fun little like big sister little brother thing, which I really adore. Um, mm-hmm. Reed cannot use chopsticks. How do you have so many PhDs and not? know how to use chopsticks he also makes like a kind of insensitive comment yeah. like he, he's like seven million people use these to eat how and i was like all right exoticism we don't need to do this like <laughs> jj does laugh at him and it's very adorable and then she's like here i'll help you and she takes him and she does the like hair tie 
at the end to make them easier. And then he he still cannot use them. And it is the fun. What I thing. love is that in the like far in the sort of like wide angle shot of like the whole table, you can see that he has quite a bit of food on his chopsticks and he looks like he's going fine. And then anytime they <laughs> cut to a close up, he is the most bumbling fucking idiot I've ever seen in my life. This tells me that either I mean the truth, which is that Matthew Gray Goobler um is fine with chopsticks, but it also <laughs> tells me that Reed is like, oh JJ, help me with my chopsticks. <laughs> which i do like um oh yeah l and Derek and gideon have all changed into casual clothing and then jj and hodge are still in their suits which i was like sure. you know you know those bitches went to their like hotel rooms kept working until someone was like hello we're in new york we're getting chinese food you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, adorable and then let's see there's a moment when they're they're talking about like work talk uh, like shop talk serial killer stuff and Elle complains about it and then Hosh looks at her and goes so Elle are you dating anybody? And she's like so the answer <laughs> so good I love this team as a family it's it, so good I also love that Hotch like twice now on the plane when he's like you need to get Reed to take a fucking vacation and now he's like oh you want to talk about our personal lives Elle? Is that what you want? <laughs> you want to talk about our personal lives? So Elle you dating anyone? You dating? You're dating? Hey, Elle, do you have sex? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, no, thank you. This is deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> so funny. I love Dad Hotch this episode. Yeah. Dad Hotch has some, like, moments to shine. This is a very fun Hotch episode. This is like a, you know, Hotch is a person. Yeah. He wears a suit 24-7. But he's a person. person. Underneath that suit is a heart of gold. <laughs> okay so funny so okay they talk about the hole in the profile and jj's like what hole in the profile they say it could be a cop you know they talked about like close to systems of justice criminals mm-hmm. etc et um oh and i also put that they're sh- oh i forgot to mention they're sharing dishes they're like they are. They're, they're like taking some onto their plate and putting it down and gideon's like hey hand me that mushu pork would you and they like pass it along the table i was like yeah. i love them and you know that at the family. end, at the end, like Hotch is like, I'm paying. But the woman goes, oh, don't worry. He already gave his card. And Gideon like did the thing where he walked in. He gave, handed his card to the way just right away and said, I'm paying. You know, so Hotch is like, I'm going to pay. And Gideon's like, has already given him his card. That's how I imagine they are every single time they go out. Nobody else even pretends. No like, one else even pay. tries anymore. They're like, they know no. they're not going to win this. Yeah. JJ and Reed and Elle are like, I'm not paying for dinner. Paying for and free food. Morgan, like once a month, Morgan will be like, oh, I'll. And then let Hosh be like, no, you know? <laughs> yeah. Derek at least makes an effort to make it seem like he no. wants to pay for their food. Right. The other thing, every- not at all. Everybody no. else is like, no, you all can take care of it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I will take the leftovers, though. Thank you very much. Yeah. Reed and JJ have never paid for a meal in their <laughs> lives since they started working at the BAU. L like tried at first, and then JJ and Reed were like, L. You don't need to. L, do you want to pay for this entire team to eat Chinese food? And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't wanna, I'd rather not pay at all. Wonderful, beautiful. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, they're talking about that. It could be a police officer. Funny, it's cute, it's cute. Uh, Hotch asks if she's dating anyone. She continues to talk about work. And then she's like, okay, well, fine. Why aren't we going to say it's a cop? And then this is where they say the cops would stop helping us. Yeah, I think Gideon, the specific line Gideon says that they would like close ranks or something like that. Yeah, which is, it's weird to me because literally in LDSK, they mentioned that it could be a cop to the cops. Yeah. So like, Maybe because it's New York and not... Well, I guess LDSK was in, like, St. Louis, I think. Wasn't... Yeah, LDSK was in... I think it was in St. Louis. No, it was in Des Moines because we had a whole bit about how you pronounce Des Plaines and Des Moines. Right! Right! Wow, I didn't remember that one. Good bit memory, dude. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> there are several callbacks in this episode. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been dropping them. Um, for the real fans. 
<laughs> of which I am apparently not one, even no. though I edit the episode post the episode. You think I take ten and a half pages of notes per episode and I don't remember our fucking bits? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay, so true. Okay, Miss One Post it Note. <laughs> Best of montage coming when, James. Yeah. Just let me know. Just l- Note down the time codes. I'll put it in. It's Let's coming go. right after that Josh montage. God, fuck you. Jesus Christ. Anyway. Um, okay, we see a clip of the unsub getting off the bus. And then Gideon gets a call. And everyone's like teasing Reed about the chopsticks. And then Gideon is like, the vigilante did just take out a cop killer. And everyone's like, um. It's funny because they like look around the, like at the table. And they're just like. We were eating though. Like we were having such a good time. Does this mean we have to leave the restaurant or like? <laughs> yeah. Does this mean we can't take leftovers, you guys? Yeah. So we learned about this new victim. It's his name is Sean Cooley. He killed two Port Authority cops and then walked. And the only witness was shot six times outside of his house. Yikes! Yeah. So the police recanvassed during the day, and then JJ like gets. The newspaper and it's like it is always the same reporter this guy named lance wagner mm-hmm. is like fucking deifying this vigilante and she's like all mad um and i gotta like, say i hate her outfit this episode i don't like it it's like the weird, like oh it's black like, tiny sweater over the pause, white pause, button up pause i need a jj outfit check real quick at the chinese restaurant she has straight hair cut to her in the precinct her hair is like beautifully curled did she (laughs) okay okay i love this choose your own adventure book that we always get (laughs) let's go it's like did she say i need a minute back at the hotel room to change and that included curling her hair or did they finish dinner in stony silence (laughs) she Go home and then like sleep in curlers to wake up with curly hair the next day? Or did she wake up and then decide she wanted curly hair? It's it's just such a dramatic like curls like that take time. She hasn't had curls like that since derailed. And they decided from like when they got a phone call about a new killing to the when they got the newspaper in the morning, she did full fucking I mean, I guess since it's... I mean, the patch would be fucking ringlets. I guess since it's implied that they did... That the guy killed last night when they're meeting Detective Bennett uh, in the morning, I guess it makes sense that she would have probably slept in curlers. Because they're at the the Chinese restaurant when this guy murders someone. The body is found. Gideon gets a phone call. And then evening yeah so yeah it's like nighttime outside so like some like they left that chinese restaurant and she went i'm gonna do my hair like <laughs> excuse me jj <laughs> okay like, i here's here's what i bet here's what i bet went through her mind mm. she was like i'm gonna have to try and fucking sweet talk some reporter tomorrow oh i might as well curl my fucking hair tonight you know she, she's like this she's like this is gonna be the newspaper again i'm gonna need to fucking talk to this guy I'm or like to... she's like i would need to make a press appearance i might as well just curl my hair you know it's just i'm so glad they dropped that look for her <laughs> because it's just like jj who never leaves the office somehow has time to like curl her hair I yeah. hate I hate this across the board when it is so clear a professional has done the character's hair. Like, yeah. Like the braid that they're wearing or the fancy bun. It's like you didn't do that. And it's <laughs> out of character you. for you to have done that. Yeah. You know? This felt like one of those. Like I literally like watched the scene, it faded to black as commercial, and it came back and I was like, what? Hold on. What? <laughs> Hold on. When the fuck did you do your hair? Yeah. yeah. But you're so right about her outfit. She's wearing like a long sleeve white button down with a collar and then like a, a cupped sleeve sweater. Yeah. It's like a so weird not like Yeah, it's like a fucking weird sleeve, like baby doll cut sleeve. It's fucking weird. I feel like JJ was supposed to be like the cute, pretty, sexy character, but like 
AJ Cook is like kind of butch. So like anytime <laughs> they were like, we're going to make you like pretty and cute. AJ Cook is like, okay, but I am going to wear something hideous to make up for this hairdo you have me in. Here's the other thing is I think they just didn't fucking know how to dress AJ Cook in 2005. Which is crazy to me. Like, I really think they could have done, like, small... Like, it would have been a completely different show, a completely different JJ, but they could have done, like, small town girl, a little overwhelmed in the big city, but, you know... Doing her best, yeah. Doing her best, strong heart. They could have dressed her in, like, cuter, cl- like, cuter clothes, you know? But instead, it's like, they chose to go the route of, like, she is a strong woman, you know, smart as hell, athletic, mm-hmm. take no shit. Oh, she's always angry. JJ is always angry. Yeah. And they were like, but she doesn't know how to dress herself. But she did just steal all of her mom's clothes before she moved to DC. Yeah, it's one of those things where like, you know, when she was in college, she was doing her soccer star and then she went to grad school and didn't have any money. And now she's like been with the BAU for a couple of years. So she has like some money, but she's probably saving most of it because of like rent is really high in DC, you know. So her money's yeah. probably not going to like a clothing. Like, God, that fucking episode, what is it? It's um it's like two eleven, I think, with um curly haired sex worker killer boy. Oh yeah. Um JJ spends the entire episode in this oversized, like baggy suit. Like it is comically too large for her you know and it's just like indicative of this like they really wanted her to seem like she's professional she's good at her job she's smart but like outside of that she doesn't really know how to do anything you know but then they just drop they just drop that in season three she gets chef's kiss so hot Start dressing her real right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they really start treating her right later. But oh. I also just think, I guess we've talked about this a lot. I don't think the wardrobe department on these early seasons was very good. I don't think so either. And it's not to like, I know wardrobe in television and film is like probably like undervalued and underpaid as oh, most yeah. support departments are in film and TV. But y'all really didn't do a like great job here, honestly. <laughs> And it's weird to see, like, the stages of development of characters' wardrobes. Because, like, Hotch started out in, like, suits that were way too big for him. And then he ends up, he could be a fucking suit model. He's hot. I know. You know, and then... He gets, like, he gets the hot, hot dad treatment. Yeah. Right now, he's, like, cute. I just had a baby. Trying my best, dad. I work a lot. And then he gets, like, hot dad treatment. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, Morgan starts off in these, like, polos and, and oversized suits and we've talked about how like it was important for his character you know, the show and the time made it important for his character to seem respectable mm-hmm. as a black man kind of thing you know um but then they like drop that and they're like fuck it Morgan's hot let him just hot you know yeah Shamar Moore was like I am fucking sick of these terrible suits just let me wear a workout shirt please they, they like made him dress like someone who like goes golf like, that's what Derek looks like in season one. He's yeah. a douchebag, he's disrespectful, <laughs> and he spends his time on the links, you know? And I hate that. And as soon as they drop that, he becomes a nice guy. Like, the most protective, sweet, but, like, aggressive and defensive. Um, And then, just, hot man. He's just so good. He's so good. And then Reed, Reed kind of, I think, because it's Matthew A. Goodler, got the, like, good clothes kind of from the start. Like, they're dorky, but they're, like, cute chic. And then he turns into, like, hipster chic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't say too much about his outfits because they're your outfits. I would also wear those, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She says that the reporter is deifying the vigilante. And then Gideon says, I'm not even happy with the results when God plays God. What a weird fucking line, huh? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know how I feel about this one. Like, I mean, sure, I get it. Like, I get the sentiment. But he's he's very pro-God, ain't he? 
Yeah, I really wonder when they wrote that line, how did they intend for that line to land? You know? Right. Because many would think it doesn't really, he like, you know, it's, it's, he doesn't give it much inflection. But it's, yeah, it's like, you know, like, it's a joke, but he doesn't necessarily, he isn't necessarily like joking. Joking. Yeah. So I wonder if that was written to be said more like a joke or if it was written to be a sort of like, well, Gideon's struggling with his faith kind of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. But they didn't comment on faith at all earlier when they were in a fucking church. So. You know, I'm just realizing now maybe that's why Hallelujah plays because he's the guy's like playing God. But I don't like that. He's not playing God. He's playing judge and jury. It doesn't have. It's not a religious thing, you know. Yeah, and also the the like Hallelujah doesn't. No, it's also a Jewish song. Yeah, which is never meant. They don't separate any kind of religion in this. Um, okay, Tanya Pinkin make think it's like a joke that the cops want to make a wish list for the guy. Um. I like that they use her as sort of like a temperature check on the police, yeah. but also like she's just a genuinely like good character. Like she comes up with like some coffee and just just like chatting with the it's with the It's because Tanya B. Pinkins is the best person on the planet. So true, but I like this is I think one of yeah. the first cops that like I remember from early Criminal Minds. Like I don't remember any of the other cops they've worked with before. I I only the only other one I really remember is the LDSK. But that was similar, a female, a black female chief, you know, who's yeah. like who's whip smart and is on the BAU's level. Yeah, I like um, it because they don't like need to explain to her everything. Yeah. They I sort think- of just like let her figure it out, which I think is what makes the cops more the B cops on the show more enjoyable. It can only do so much, but yeah, you know what I'm thinking now? When they go, when they have cases like in cities, like I just watched um, 219, which takes place in San Francisco. Um, when they have episodes that take place in cities, the cops are more like on their shit. Like they know a little bit more about stuff. Yeah. As opposed to like when they go to middle of fucking nowhere, you know, Tiny this towns, Wyoming. cops don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, they have to do a lot more like explaining. So I think because mm-hmm. like, like the two that I really remember from this season are the one from um, Des Moines and this one from New York. You know, places where crime happens more often. Yeah, you know, as opposed to like who the fuck else in those tiny towns we keep talking about. You know, like who are those police officers? They're no one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like the episodes, like there's some episodes where cops are like tools and there's some episodes where cops are characters. Yeah. You know, and I think this one is very much the cops. She's kind of sending it for all the cops, but the cops are a character. character you know, yeah. How That's the a good cops, way to put it. How the cops are reacting, what their, you know, responses, et cetera, et cetera, matters in this episode. So we have a well-developed cop character to voice how the cops are feeling as opposed to just like where all the cops are confused you know yeah Um, yeah no you're totally right yeah that's just that's a good way to word it okay they see the episode title because they get a letter that says someday a real rain will come and wipe all the scum off the streets and then reed says taxi driver Uh uh-huh is that quote from the movie taxi driver they don't get a letter, by the way. That's a quote from the article by the journalist. Oh, he is he quoting the killer or like himself? I think Hotch just, Hotch just reads a quote, and I think it is from a movie Taxi Driver. Someday a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. That is a... Yuck. Taxi driver. From Taxi Driver. And you know who knows that? Reed. Reed, I don't know what Twilight is. What is that? Is that a song? Can f- no recognize a fucking quote from Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver is from 1976. Taxi Driver is one of those movies. From before like, Reed was born. Yeah, and Gideon even like... Of. Gideon 
also I'll, I'll bring this up in a second um but like reed like a little while later reed makes a reference and gideon said reed makes a reference about a crime and gideon says you weren't even born and reed says i read a lot and it's like a cute interaction but like it happening in episode 17 feels weird like Reed was talking about the Zodiac Killer earlier. Where was, was that? Awesome. Like, you weren't born yet then. Why now? Why this killer? I don't... Gideon, my guy. I Come don't on. understand the way he sees Reed. Gideon is like, sometimes think... Reed is a tool. Sometimes Reed is a character. <laughs> like, I think Gideon forgets what happens the previous episode every new episode. <laughs> I think he just forgets. Gideon is full mind wipe, no character growth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm right, and yeah, you know it. No, I, now that you say that, Gideon really is like, what? I've been to Des Moines? <laughs> like, <laughs> also, I have to say, the LDSK episode was in Des Plaines. Oh, Des Plaines. Des Plaines. Des Plaines, Illinois. Oh, right. It was in Des Plaines because we were like... And we were joking about Des Moines, yes. Yeah, okay. Des Plaines. I'm sorry because I knew somebody else was going to come and get our ass for that. (laughs) So I had to be the one to get your ass first. That's fine. Oh, you can get this ass anytime. Don't. (laughs) No. No. All right. No. Okay. So then they're like, well, he hasn't contacted... the Unsub hasn't contacted the press. Don't they always contact the press? And then they're like, the BAU says, no, because it's not about clout. Like, this guy has a mission. Um, and then JJ says, I'm going to contact the press archives and find the next victim. I'm going to catch the victim before the unsub does. And I said, fucking get it, JJ. Yeah, she's like on her shit. This is like a good episode for JJ. She is like, moving and shaking like i know she's not a main character in this episode not really but she does so much in this episode that i was like oh they're trying some shit out they're They're trying some shit putting some feelers yeah al brings in the tip line recording and it's people like supporting him um derek i put derek gets a penelope call flirting I love them this episode. Penelope only is only here for like a minute total, but she's so cute this entire time. Yeah, she's in like She has years. that fun interaction with Hotch earlier. Um and Fountain of Knowledge, check my flow. <laughs> yeah, and then she has this one with Derek where they're just yeah. like having a cute flirty back and forth. I love her. Yeah. Um so they talk about the victims. There's no overlap. But they were all processed at the same courthouse, Manhattan Criminal Courthouse. But there's 122,198 cases every year. Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When later we found out he's the stenographer, mm-hmm. I was like, hey, Garcia, that's an overlap. Like, if you know they're all processed at the same courthouse, like, wouldn't it come up that they all have this, like, if, especially because they're looking at people who were in the courthouse, judges, bailiffs, etc. Like, if you're looking at just, like, a list of the people involved in the case, like, there's the same dude's name on every single one. Yeah, she, that does strike me as weird. Because later, she's she even the does one who it finds up. it. Later, they're like, they're like, check the stenographer on all the cases. And she's like, it's the same one. Hey, Garcia, that was literally what you were supposed to be doing here. Baby girl, you are so cute, but you are sometimes girl, so dumb, girl, and I, I love you, that but for you, you. You did fucking drop the ball on this one, baby girl. How much Sweetheart. faster? Sweetheart, imagine... I adore you, but this one was a fumble. I'm not gonna lie to you. Imagine though, like they call Garcia, and she's like, "Yeah, actually, they all have the same court stenographer." And everyone goes, "Oh, let's, let's go talk to him." <laughs> and then it's like, "No, it's him." Cool, great, well, how lucky, wonderful. Thanks, Garcia. You solved the case, but no. <laughs> It does seem weird to me because she checked and she was like, there was no overlap in like public defenders or judge or anything else. I'm like, but so you were looking at the courtroom records, right? So you were like looking at the names of the people in the room though. Right? Yeah, you were. <laughs> yeah, but like fuck stenographers, am I right? Fuck court stenographers, reporters. Stenographers and court reporters, you are so important. No. You oh my are God. so important. Yeah. 
you deserve so much more credit than this episode gives you. Exactly. You are the fucking backbone of the criminal justice system. I know. And they, like, they try to, like, give them credit when, like, oh, they have to take all the work home and then type it up and, like, bring it back and, like, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, they're also kind of like, no one would notice them. No one would see them. No one cares about them. It was just like, okay, well. Fucking harsh, dude. <laughs> like, they're in the in the room. You know, like the assumption is that like, because they're in their tiny little seat, no one ever talks to them, ever. When like, one of the fucking dumbest, like, one of the things that they do in movies all the time is like, I would like that noted on the record, please. Like, hey. let the record show. Like, and, and also later when they like go into the courtroom to like, talk to him, the, the like, um, security guard guy is like oh what's his name called out sick today so that guy knows him by name yeah these people work together day in day out yeah. and you're like, like nobody sees yeah. this guy and, and he's what? like a, he's assigned to that courtroom mm -hmm. because he called him sick and so somebody replaced him like he's that courtroom's stenographer i okay fine criminal minds um have stenographers your you do such stupid, important yes. work Seriously, back. Home. You deserve the world for what you do, honestly. Yeah. They get paid like shit. I mean, which isn't surprising, but is disappointing. Also, I love that they like named everyone in a courtroom but the stenographer. They were like the judge, the bailiff, the other security people, the like, the public defenders, the attorneys, the, the, other, the other attorneys. Um, who else Something is in else? a courtroom? <laughs> who else is a major part of the courtroom? And I don't know. It felt like a fucking moment in like Dora where Dora would turn to the screen and be like, do you know who else is in a courtroom? Like, Do you know who's in charge of writing everything down always, all the time, for every case constantly? Or, yeah. Um, okay, so then Derek goes to give them the news and he like remembers the exact number of cases. Which I think is so cute. Because it, it like, cuts from cute. Penelope saying it and Derek being like, oh yeah, okay. And then it cuts to Hodge asking, do you know how many cases? And then Derek just parrots it again. <laughs> parrots yeah. it again. I love it. It's just like 122,198 a year. And Hodge is like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, as long as you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah. So then um, they are like, okay, he's going to have like a history of um, erratic behavior. Oh, and then somebody says, instead of crime groupies, they say crime groupies. Like that. I think crime sometimes it's, it's very funny when actors just like forget how to talk. Crime groupies. I think that's very funny. <laughs> I love so it when stupid. actors just forget how to say words, right? Um. Yep. So then, Al and Derek go to help JJ and Hotch, Gideon and Reed go to the courthouse. I love. Yeah, I was gonna say I love the fact that we started off this uh this episode by being like, "This is a fucking nothing burger. We'll get through this quick." And then it's been an hour and forty five minutes now, and we're well, like, "We did talk about Shrek and storytelling." That's true. We had a lot of other talks. Hmm. All right. Hotch asks if Gideon would ever consider being a vigilante. And Gideon says no, because it'd be too much like being the unsub. And then they mentioned the boys in Iowa, which I did look up. I was like, oh, is that something that happened in the time? No, they mentioned it later. It's fake. Um, Gideon's trying to like talk to this woman who looks so like annoyed. And she's like, the cops already talked to me. And he's like, I'm going to talk to you anyway. True New Yorker being annoyed at everything. I love New Yorkers yeah. in TV shows. So he says, okay, the guy would be quiet. He'd seem like he's seen too much. And then Hotchuk picks it up in a different room and says he's small. He's meticulous. Oh, excuse me. He had a personal brush with crime. He would support the vigilante. And if someone like mentions the vigilante, he'd like talk about them constantly. But he like won't bring him, bring him up himself. Um, and he probably hasn't mentioned him in a while. And then the woman is like, that's most people in the building, dude. Like, we're all fucking tired of crime. It's part of the job. Yeah, and then we got back to the courthouse, the courtroom, and you're so right. I literally wrote Zoom on painting, but I wrote it because I didn't I didn't get it. They they zoom on the painting now, but then they also do it again. That's later, how Hotch remembers. 
when Hotch like looks yeah. at the court stenographer and then he like follows the court yeah. stenographer's like line of sight yeah, to, the, to painting. the painting. And I made a note that the court stenographer is in the room during the scene. Oh, um, is he? Yeah, he's in the background packing up his stuff. Huh. Yeah, because I, I was like, I was like, they're not going to be good about that twice in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and they oh, were. Oh, but they will. Maybe I need to give Criminal Minds just a smidge more credit. Not that much. No, literally Maybe a just a smidge. Yeah. Oh, and then the guy is like, how old are you to read? And reads is 24. Um, and the man is like, in six years, you'll be considering doing what this guy is doing now. Um, which is odd. And then Gideon is like, oh. Reed's only a year older than I am. Yeah, brah. JJ is my fucking age. Yes. I don't know why I just realized that. Why you this and episode I, is like. We are Reed and JJ. Think about Aww. that. Think about these children. God. When I realized she was fucking 27 in season one, I was like, oh no. My <laughs> sweet, sweet summer child. Like, everyone talks about Reed being baby, but like, Hello? Reed's 24. Wow. Sorry, that just like really hit me that Reed is the same age as me or a year older than I am. Like, yeah. that feels insane to me. Yeah, these are children. Like, it's it's so funny. I feel like when you're younger, you know, when you're like 20 or, you know, 15, like when you're younger, you hear 24 and you're like, that's an adult. You hear 27 and you're like, that's a grown ass woman. But like, then you get to be 24 and then you get to be 27 <laughs> and you're like, no, no, I, I don't mean, think like, I'm like, 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 yes, I do think I'm older and more experienced, more mature than a 20 year old, but like, no, I'm barely more than a quarter of my life through. Like, it's like not as old as you think it is. That's fucking insane. Yeah. Like, Sorry, compared- I don't know why. I don't know why yeah. Reed just saying I'm 24 really like hit me, but I'm like, damn. Yeah. He said He's that. And only I was like, a year older than I am. He wow. Said that, he said that. And I was like, God, that's like out of my dating range. I wouldn't date a 24 year old. They're so young. <laughs> so when he said that, I literally was like, oh, God. Oh, like, God. Why am I three years older than Spencer Reed in this episode? I just like <laughs> that so fucking much. Um, yeah, okay. Oh my god, I'm gonna grow up with Reed. No, I hate this. <gasps> Actually, stop. I don't like this anymore. Oh, I like that. Okay, I'll grow up with JJ. I don't like this anymore. Well, grow <laughs> up with them. It just reminded me how many fucking years we're gonna be doing this podcast. <laughs> In 15 years, when I'm 40 fucking two, and you're, what, 38? <laughs> oh, oh, Christ, God. I'm a Mm-hmm. God. <laughs> what the fuck when i like wrote down at the top of my notes 117 i was like we're make- we're moving and shaking and then i realized we've been doing this for like six months six months yeah and we've made it halfway through season one we're almost done with season one to be fair. Aren't there like 23 episodes? Don't we have like six there's, episodes? There's 22 episodes. So five we... Five episodes left of season one. Yeah, we only have five episodes left. Can we go back to the episode now? You did this. You had a mental breakdown. I'm sorry. I'm so- you just I'm really kind of hit me how We don't call them Reed mental is. breakdowns anymore. Um, no, right. that one for me, that was a break. That was a mental breakdown for it's me. It's just a mini little toe dip and a panic attack. I was just hit with a with just like a wave of acknowledgement. Yeah. And that was bad. Continue. Okay. Gideon is just standing in the lobby reading the paper. You know, as you do. And reads like what happens in Iowa. And Hotch I wrote it's an early Hotch case. Early in his career at the BAU. It was a small town, two boys were murdered by the local four H leader. And when they found him, he was, like, suicidal. He had his gun drawn. And he was, like, holding a shotgun to Hotch. And Hotch talked him down. He went to trial. Um, but then his wife gave him an alibi and he got off. And then he ended up killing another boy. I didn't realize just how the similarities to how this episode ends. Yeah. Hotch and Gideon talking him down. 
I well, think that that's why, and rewatching this final scene, by the way, I do think that is why Hotch does shoot him. Instead of trying to keep talking him down. Yes, because he knew a jury wouldn't convict this guy. Mm, and he didn't want to have it again. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Hallelujah's coming angle, back at me. <laughs> the angle that he, the guy gets shot at is very much from the right, which is where okay. Hotch was standing, and the, the sniper angle would have been more down and from the left. Okay. So. Interesting. Yeah. And that's, I made a note about how at the end of the episode, they're all just kind of like walking around, like <laughs> staring at the ground, kind of being like, this was a toughie. Well, Hallelujah played. And I was like, okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, sure. Sure, Aaron. Uh, yeah. And I wrote that the, in this scene, there's an implication that Hotch would want justice for those boys. Like that Hotch could like blame himself for them getting, for that mm-hmm. other boy being killed. Um, and that's why he's kind of like connecting a little bit with this vigilante because he like gets where he's coming from. Yeah. I just like it just reminds me of Hotch's whole thing in Natural Born Killer, but he was like some people with rough experiences grow up to be violent, and some people with rough experiences grow up to stop violence. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those things. So I don't I don't really like that they compare Hotch to this guy or that Hotch is comparing himself to this guy. It's like so different. Yeah. Like sure, like it's a similar, I guess, experience, but also this guy's like a like I know we just said like court stenographers are the backbones of the criminal justice system, and I do believe that. But also this this guy's not like a cop. He's not like he is not a judge. He is not a lawyer, right? Like like Hotch is actively, you could see him actively making up for that one mistake. Mm-hmm. This guy is just like bitter and therefore killing people. You know, it, it's I don't and like also, that he's being compared. By to the Hotch. way, mentally ill. Also, Definitely. yes, one hundred percent mentally ill. Hearing voices, and we get into it later, like obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Right. So I just like don't like that they're because it feels like by comparing Hotch to this killer you're either a erasing the mentally ill aspect of this killer being like he was just some guy who wanted Mm -hmm. vengeance or you're saying that hotch is you know coded to be mentally ill in some way which i don't think he is it's a weird i don't know it's weird this episode I don't think this episode knew what it was trying to say. I think it was trying to say a lot and ended up saying nothing, aka nothing burger. Um, But like, even just story-wise, the comparisons that they draw are really interesting, especially with the boys in Iowa. Yeah, like I... I, Like, that's an interesting story to put in here and put a lot of emphasis on from Gideon. Right. To put... In the, like, law versus justice in this argument of what happened to the boys from Iowa, you know? Yeah, and I I also just don't think that, like, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Like, Hotch is already righting wrongs. And I don't mean this in, like, a copaganda kind of way. I just mean, like, you know, he has chosen a career and a path that will save more people than he hurts. And this guy is somebody with a mental illness who had something tragic happen and now cannot stop seeing himself reflected in the victims and is unable to stop his violent urges. Yeah. It's not comparable. Like, sure, Hotch had a case where, like, maybe he could have done it. But also, like, also, like, here we go, here we go. Here's a thought. Um, Hotch did the right thing. Like, it is not Hotch's fault that the jury didn't convict that guy. Yeah, and this is where it gets, like, really weird that they bring this specific case up during a larger discussion about law versus justice. Yes. Because Hotch did the correct thing, which was to turn him into the court system because they thought he had a great... They had, obviously, enough to get him. He was already depressed and suicidal. Like, this guy knew that he had done the murders and that he got caught. Yeah. And then, curveball, guy's wife popped up for him yeah like it's just such a weird 
Like, that is the law. That is not justice. But also, Hotch just, like, shooting this guy or this guy shooting himself wouldn't exactly be justice either. Yeah, and it's, like, one of those things that Criminal Minds really flip-flops on. And I think it's, like, it depends on which looks better for the cops in the episode. But, like, Mm -hmm. throughout the series, we see stuff, like, they really want to save this unsub because they've just, they've bonded with him on some level. And then the unsub gets shot and it's seen as like a failure on their part to arrest them without killing them. But then some episodes it's like, thank God that guy's dead. Now he's going to stop hurting people, you know? And it's like the show itself does not have a stance on it. And I actually, I, I made a note to talk about this later about like death as justice where like cops are not, there for justice cops are there to bring people who have done th- bad things to the place where they are judged and tried for it i would even like, expand it more than that cops aren't there for justice they're there to uphold the law in whatever way that they deem fit yes which sure yes also the law is not perfect and justice isn't perfect yeah um so it really yeah and i for just for the sake of this conversation i'm ignoring the like quotas for parking tickets kind of shit you know yeah um in ter- but in terms of like you know yeah capital crimes fighting crimes like sh- killing someone should be your last resort absolute last resort mm-hmm. right there's a reason capital punishment the death penalty is gone in almost every state right so for hotch to just kill this guy and be like, now it's done. Is like, that's not your fucking job. Your job is to catch these people. Yeah, it's certainly. <sighs> and there's, it's the, certainly and the... a weird thing to do in this nothing burger of an episode. Yeah, and it's like if the it's show certainly had... like a weird point to make. Yeah, if the show had like explored that, did Hotch do the right thing by killing him? Okay, I wish he hadn't died, but now it's an exercise in how far did the how far does justice go, right? But they did it. Justice in air quotes. Yeah, right. Like taking justice into your own hand. Like Hotch killing this guy makes Hotch a vigilante. It makes him illegal in what he's doing. Yeah. Like no one was in danger. They knew the guy was giving his gum up. The I know it like it like looks like he's pointing his gun at Gideon. Yeah, that's they do a the lot thing. of that. But like yeah. again, it feels like a fucking excuse. Yeah. Or or if they had treated it as like a suicide by cop, then then that's something yeah. to talk about. But they didn't. They just cut to Hallelujah, had they everyone look around all sad. Them. No, yeah, exactly. And then the episode ends with Hallelujah like still playing over the and credits, you're like- and you're like, "There's no message here." There's no message here. Like You have told me nothing. And I don't think shows are required to beat us over the head with a message. I actually fucking hate it when they do. We've been talking about the whole like family needs to stay together message that we hate. But you can't also just like do something and then be like, I don't know, that happened. Like, And then they just sort of like present all of these like news interviews with people to like. Right. Say so- that they're making a point like. Yeah, it's like some people thought he was like doing what all of us want to do, which is not true. And some people were like, no, he was just a murderer. Like, I'm glad he's dead. Like, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, this isn't a message because like Hotch is not dealing with the ramifications of his actions. Yeah. One thing Criminal Minds does a lot, and we'll talk about it in like later, later seasons, is like, if the team is doing it, it is good because the team is good and we like them, you know? Like, there are things the team does that they happened and I literally was like, this is so illegal. Like, hey, I would really like these these federal agents to stop being federal agents. They're being really terrible to civilians. But because we like these characters, we're supposed to be, like, they're in the right. And then anytime anyone criticizes them, they're the villain you know yeah and this feels this feels like they were heading in that direction but they didn't want to deal with the x it's season one 
So they just yeah. like, didn't. They like told the story they were gonna tell, and then we're like, okay, we'll just like put some questions at the end. Bye. <laughs> like anyway, yeah. like make your own decision. Choose yeah. what you get from this episode. Yeah. Sometimes, like when things are all fun and games, it's like, yeah, it's just a bunch of cool people who happen to be, you know, fancy cops, and then like sometimes you're just kind of like slammed with that, you know? Yeah, and it's just like, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, they're like, okay, this newspaper. <laughs> Back to the article. We learn about Iowa implication: hot for want justice, um, and then they are looking at this new pro vigilante article and they have a lot of access and JJ's like, I'm going to go talk to him. So he goes, she goes to the journalist and he's like, the FBI is getting you to do their bidding. And she's like, I'm an FBI agent. Like he's really disrespectful to her. And I love that we get, this is one of the earlier moments where JJ's like, no, I'm a fucking agent. Yeah. I'm just good at this part of the job. He's like trying to treat her like their pet reporter, you yeah. know? And she's like, I'm a fucking FBI agent, dude. And then she like, here's the thing too, is once she tells him that and they get to his desk, she like spots some like fucking file folder with a weird ass name. And he's like, oh, don't, don't mind that. Don't mind that. Don't worry yeah. about it. So it's like, obviously you can see that she knows her shit. If you're hiding your fucking file folders, like obviously. Yeah. You realize yeah. this now. Thank you. Yeah. So she like asks him for help and he recognizes Gideon's name and is like, oh, he had a rather famous meltdown. And she's like, yes. And he's co- and he solved a lot of cases since then. Like, she is so unimpressed with him. Uh, oh, and then I said she LMAO, she plays him because she's like, I mean, don't you want the story? Like, you know, we really want a story out and you'd be the only reporter we're talking to. And so he's like, yeah okay uh so they go to the precinct i was like good for you jj she went you know what fuck you (laughs) she manipulates him so well and i love it a lot also this guy is a really like well-known actor is he yeah he was in better call saul um he was also in quantico well he's had a lot of shows that he's been he was in shameless oh is Professor Hurst and Shameless? I don't know what that if that means anything to you. Um, no. I definitely like recognized him, but I couldn't like place him. Yeah, he's one of those actors that has been on every single crime procedural at least yeah. once or twice. And so you're like, hey, I know you. And then you can't, <laughs> fu- you yeah. don't know what you know him from. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so they're talking he's about- He's good though. He plays a good fucking sleaze. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so then, oh, he's the one who says the drunk driver could happen to anybody. Um, he calls Oof. Rachel a waste case. Yeah. Which I was like, one, what doesn't it six lingo? And two, hey, dude, fuck you. That's a whole ass person. That's a whole ass human being. Yeah. It was really like, even if you don't consider addiction a disease, which like it is, that I don't like this assumption of like, because you do drugs you are less than you know yeah and he says like the jury bought into that like addiction as a disease bs or whatever and it's like hey gang you could have been like well it is but let's move on but no gideon and hotch say nothing yeah um and then the taxi guy oh this reporter ragnar covered all of the original cases Mm -hmm. that's why he like put it all together because he knew the cases already. Um, and the taxi driver, he says, was a thug and his wife wouldn't testify against him. Which, again, is very victim-blaming language. Not mm-hmm. his wife was too scared. Not he intimidated his wife out of testifying. No, his wife wouldn't testify. I think this guy's just a dick. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he's like, I can feel for somebody standing up for me. And then he, like, realizes he's a suspect, and he's like, I've never been, like, a victim, so, like, why would I do this, whatever? And he's like, why the ear? Tell me about the ear stuff. Whatever. And then 
when he gets like really defensive Gideon is like yeah we know it's not you you don't have it in you to act you just live vicariously and then we do never see Wagner again it like it feels like a sick burn but at the same time like do we want him to have it in him to kill people it's weird isn't it yeah this is a weird one Gideon it's being like one, it, it? Gideon is like if you were a real man you'd actually kill people instead of just writing about it Hey Gideon, I I know being a sleazeball is not great, but I'd rather him be a sleazeball than a serial killer. Like, <laughs> I don't know. This is such a weird episode. There's no nuance in this episode at all. It's just like not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what they were doing here, but I didn't like it. I don't care for it much at all. Yeah. Um. So then we see a guy in front of a fountain at the park and a man is like approaching him and the guy's standing there in a hood and he's all like sketchy and then um he runs and the man yells and then the guy like shoots him in the chest and he falls and he like checks his chest um and then like leaves um and then the i thought the checking of the chest thing was fucking weird yeah me too like to see if he was actually dead like who the fuck does that this guy he's crazy um so then they they say though that the victim was an undercover cop so all these cops are going to be really pissed pissed he was like an undercover cop in the park because of the crimes that were happening so then the guy shows up at the station and he like puts his his gun is like upside down he's like holding it upside down showing it to everybody puts it down as soon as they tell him to he lets them cuff him and then he's like stop it we're in this together like we're doing this together um he was a security guard in a boutique in Soho um, and he got mugged and he was in the ICU and now he has confessed to doing all of his all of the crimes all of them the thing that confused me most about this dude checking if the guy was dead is number one that played off way creepier than I think they intended it to and number two this guy doesn't strike me as like a I need to make sure they're dead kind of guy he just seems like a narcissistic asshole well, I think he was, it was more like, ha ha, I did it. I killed him. It wasn't like, is he dead? But more like, you know, did I do it? Did I do it? Did I get him? You know? Yeah, okay. okay. That's what I saw it as. Yeah. And then the guy says, like, I was waiting in the park for scum. They're going to die as they lived. Um, you know, scum always shows up there. And they ask him, like, why did you turn yourself in? And he says, you know, um, I knew you guys needed help. I was inspired. I, um, wait, no, Gideon says, like, why did you turn yourself in? Do you need help? Like, I think he's, like, saying, like, did you need to, like, hear? Oh, the guy says you needed to hear my voice. I want to inspire people. I can't do this alone. I need more people to join me. And he, like, barely knows anything about the crimes. Sorry, I just, like, did not know what that note meant. Um, Gideon is like, oh, is that why you stabbed him in the groin? Like, you strapped those other ones in the groin. And the man says, it's what he deserved. So now we know, like, this isn't him. Yeah, this, this no guy's one was no stabbed shit. in the groin. Yeah. He was just taking credit for it because he was also, like, delusional. Um, and then Derek is like, yeah, he just wants glory. Um, he has, um, narcissistic delusions and the only one that he killed was the undercover cop uh, and then reed says that like they should tell the unsub that he inspired someone to kill an undercover cop like that's going to make him feel really guilty and jj is like i need to go mend some fences <laughs> she's like i guess i'll go play fucking nice now I, I do love that they did not show her having to apologize to wagner <laughs> Yeah. So she goes I back. Yeah. And there's a That's funeral. What she deserves. Yeah. They're watching the like policeman's funeral on TV. And Tanya Pinkins is like, I'll never get that sound out of my head. Um, and that's why they're like, Hey, wait a minute. The sound in the head you can't get out. Uh yep. Uh Wagner says the blood is on the vigilante's hands. Um, and they're like, if he's at the funeral, he's gonna look alone, he's gonna look out of place. Um, trying not to draw attention to himself. Uh, that comes of nothing. 
the only reason we saw the funeral was so they could make the connection to like the voice that's stuck in your head. So Derek had gone down to the courthouse and he calls Hotch and he's like, the, there's like, um, he, the victim's stenography records have not even been typed up. Those things usually don't get typed up to three to five months because the stenographers like take them home to type them. So like if someone knew about the last victim's crime records, he would have had to have been in the courtroom. And so they say it must be a court reporter because they transcribe testimony. So he would have those voices in his head. And they're like, oh, that woman's a piano motion, but it's actually a transcribing motion. Yeah, and the motion that he was making was sort of like he was typing. Um, if you guys haven't seen a steno machine, they're actually like really neat. Um, yeah. They're made. They're made so they're like you type out vowel sounds, not letters, and so it's much quicker to type out an accurate record of what was said. But uh, as I make mention of later this episode, only you hear words the way that you hear words. So like court stenographer's notes can only be transcribed by that court stenographer because nobody else would know what the yeah. fuck those that combination means. Like it's so hard to hear just like vowels stated and be like, ah, so this is baloney. The word is baloney. Right. When you're like, bow, og, na, what? Yeah. And you know, so um, court stenography, super fascinating field. Yeah. Highly recommend y'all look yeah. into it. It's very fun. It's pretty interesting. I wrote down that it reminded me of shorthand. Like we say shorthand to mean like writing shorter versions of words, but shorthand is an actual language. It's an alphabet. Um, secretaries, yeah. the reason, well, you know, receptionists, but secretaries, when they were secretaries, the reason they had to go to like secretarial school was because like they literally had to learn like a whole other language. So if you look at like a, a secretary's notes, they looks like, hieroglyphs the same way the stenographers do because it's yeah. just like squiggles the same way like medical doctors handwriting looks illegible but it's actually like a specific alphabet they use yeah. you know so i thought that was really cool that i didn't know stenographers had the same it makes sense but that fast you type um yeah because they have to type so quickly yeah in court yeah like, and, and the same way secretaries have to take notes so fast when they have things being shouted at them and like doctors are always in a hurry they've got to do shorthand for these pharmaceutical work you know all that kind of stuff um yeah i just that God, it's so neat yeah so they infer that the voices were the voices of the victims he's hearing the testimony in his head they ask garcia to look for the stenographer's names this is marvin doyle his parents were killed again this is something that would have been great for her to figure out earlier two days and- ago logically she should have but yeah. for tv world it means that she didn't this is another case that was like could have been solved after the episode. We keep running yeah. into these. Mm-hmm. This is Season what I mean one cases I... are just like that. Yeah, this is what I mean when I say like they had a profile and then they like built a case around it, and sometimes it like wasn't enough. Yeah, they were like, "Fuck, this is only twenty minutes, guys. We gotta throw in some false flags here. Give me a red herring or three. <laughs> like, oh, a false flag, you say? <sighs> That's the name of an episode later." All right. It's a great episode. It's a bananas episode. Okay. (laughs) Marvin Doyle, the stenographer. His parents were killed in an armed robbery in 2004. He works at Manhattan Criminal Courthouse Center, whatever. Um, He's sick. And there's another, um, what is it? Wait. Hotch and Reed go to his courthouse, courtroom. Mm -hmm. And he's sick. So he he called out sick. Uh, And so they're looking at a new stenographer. They, like, zoom in on the stenographer and he's just, like, making eye contact with the camera while he's, like, typing. <laughs> he's and just I was, minding his fucking business. I was like, that dude is creepy as hell. But then Hotch does, like, see the painting of Lady Justice blindfolded and is like, we were in here before. The stenographer was there and he was like, he saw us, you know. Yeah. So then Gideon, Hotch, L, Morgan, and Reed go to his apartment. They clear the apartment and they find the windows covered in the insulation and the foil. And they're like, it's to keep the voices out. And then as soon as Gideon peels back one corner of that, (laughs) it's like... It's the noisiest New York street I've ever fucking heard. There is an ambulance going by. It's like every window in his apartment is covered. But as soon as Gideon folds back one corner, (laughs) it's like, there it is. 
you know the busiest street in New York. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I like yes, let the sound in, but like he's not living in a balloon. You didn't like pop <laughs> his balloon, you know? Like it was so weird. I think it's so funny. That was so such a weird um foley effect. Uh, okay, they find a check, a two year old check for a life insurance policy for 200k and Hotch is like he won't accept blood money Um, (laughs) which is really dramatic but very funny yeah it's not but that's not what blood money is blood money would be like if the killer had sent Sent him money money. not your your parents already had a life insurance policy like your parents they had the money they paid into that yeah, like that's, that's your parents' money. They wanted you to have that. That's why they have a life insurance policy. So when Hotch was like, he won't accept blood money, I was like, ah, I don't think that's what blood money is. I think spending that money would remind him that his parents were dead. I think that's trauma money. I don't think that's bl- blood money. But also 250000 Yeah. In 2006 money. In New York? In New York. In New York. That's like three months of rent. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, okay. There are photos on his dresser of him like kissing someone, and then the someone's face is all like scratched out and stuff. So he's like divorced, but they never mention that ever. No, I think that was his mother. Oh, kissing him on the cheek because it was a cheek. Kiss. Yeah, it was a cheek kiss. I think that was oh. his mother. Oh, that makes sense. You're welcome. I mean, thank you. Sometimes I think you get very caught up in notes and I'm here to be like, no, that's his mom. That's what would make sense. That was his mother. Yeah. Um, And I love that for us. Yeah, that's good for us. Um, Okay, they go into his office and they find a box full of flint knives. Uh, Like a big ass box. Yeah, like one of those paper Big like supply crates like of flint Flint knives. Where where is he getting these? Is he making them? That's what I want to know. No, but they're like packaged. Like they had to have come from somewhere. Like, did he? Why did they not try and find the flint knives? Bro, from the beginning they had those fucking knives, and they didn't even try to see where they were coming from. I bet you there are not that many places that make flint knives. Not enough to keep using them and breaking them. Not enough. Not ones that are small enough to go into somebody's fucking ear. Wow, BAU, you slipped up on this one. (laughs) Hey, Garcia, where in New York City can you get flint knives with this measurement? Here's what it looks like. Yeah, literally, like, it's not that. That's that's where my brain went. I was like, why are you guys not looking at the knives? Maybe he hasn't. I love how they just don't mention things if they don't plan on doing it. If they have no. They don't mention ballistics or like flint knives. They're like, no, we're not fucking mentioning it. If they don't have a way of like writing it off, either writing it off or making it important, they just don't mention it. That's coming to mind in a nutshell. Um, okay. So she also has boxes for like every case he's worked on in his office. And then they find a stenography machine and all the keys are worn out. And Gideon is like, he tried to tra- transcribe the voices in his head. Um, and then Alice says they look like hieroglyphics. This is the steno language we were telling you about before. Um, they start looking through the boxes and they're like, okay, we're going to look for capital crimes with acquittals. And Ella's like, shouldn't we look at the most recent ones first? And Reed says, no, he most likely has OCD in which case he would complete a task and then start over again. So like, there's no way of knowing like where in the process he was, but that he probably like had to keep reading them over and over and over again. Um, and then they were like, okay, look for cases where the accused had to take the stand. So then they find Ted Elmore, who killed his parents because they were physically abusing him for years. Mm -hmm. This, I didn't like this. Yeah. I didn't like this because he, it could have been a self-defense case. I think the trigger was that he killed his parents, and this guy has dead parents. But at the same time, like, I don't know. If it had been a parent who killed their child and then got off, you know. Mm -hmm. But, like, a kid who could have been in self-defense. Like, I think they wanted us to, like, 
look at it as like this guy's parents were dead and then this person chose to kill their parents. But like, no. Not really. I mean, yeah, I can see though how they were trying to play it. But like, this is an abuse victim. Yeah. And if this guy really gives a shit about people. Like, this is not the case that would have triggered him. But I think it was the parents, and I think I, it was yeah. that this guy said that he was a victim of abuse, which is what sort of Gideon has a weird like victim, victim, victim moment, and like that's exactly how Mandy Patinkin said it. Uh, and Gideon, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> um, I think he had like that good moment, and so this guy claiming to be a victim on the sand of abuse. That's sort of like what triggered him, I guess. Oh, like he's the one who killed people, but he's claiming to be a victim. Yes. I mean, I guess that goes back to like Rachel being a drug addict and having, you know, in quotation marks, killed her boyfriend and then yeah. claimed to be a, a victim. victim of addiction. And then also, okay. I think they make a mention of like the priest claimed that he was a victim of recent hysteria. Right. So I think it was just like a victim, victim, victim thing that set him off. Okay, I get that. I just, I didn't like that. Like this guy, like, I mean, obviously, like, don't kill people, right? But like, this guy got out of his abusive home and has a wife. And, a and nice seems apartment. very normal. He's just like walking into his apartment and it's yeah, like, hey, and then honey. he has to get shot. And it's also like, yeah, I didn't. I didn't like it. Anyway, we cut to a picture of Ted Elmore and the guy's like in his car holding his like arrest photo, his mugshot, and you see Ted walking and Gideon calls Ted's house. The wife answers and he's like, oh, it's the FBI. Um, and then we see the answer of following Ted into the apartment and so or into the building. And then we realize Ted's walking into his apartment where his wife is. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer just fucking shoots him in the chest. Like, and then from like Gideon, Gideon hears the gunshot over the call and he's like, Mrs. Elmore, Mrs. Elmore. Like, no, she's not going to fucking respond to you, Gideon. Just she's not gonna go, like, dude. Oops, sorry, he um he did shoot my husband just now. Like, <laughs> come on. What the fuck? Just yes. go to your car, man. It's yes. New York. It's already going to take you way too long to get there. I know. So they all go to the apartment. This is where Tanya Pinkins is like, there are snipers everywhere. And Gideon's like, I'm going to talk to him. Um, we rushed him. He's not going to want an innocent hostage. Yada, yada, yada. It was so crazy. It was like, out. Of, it felt like out of nowhere, this guy was suddenly also a victim. And like, I get like, yes, mental illness. Yes, all that. Yes, whatever. But like the whole episode, they've been very like, we got to stop him. Fuck this guy. Yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden it's like, no, we need to have sympathy to him for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's and fucking weird. Yeah, and like Tony Tanya Pinkins was the bad guy for trying to save this couple's life. It was just like it was it came out of nowhere. It was especially weird because I just think this episode pivoted like three times on what it wanted to say, and I don't yes. know if three wrongs exactly made a right. You know, That's I don't know if they came full circle back around, right? Which is yeah unfortunate it, yeah it like started off as like blitz killer how are we gonna track him disorganized and then it was like okay he is organized and he's part of the system and like you know we don't want something like that in the system and then it was like oh no he's gonna inspire more people to kill and then it was like actually he was a victim all along actually he's just mentally ill and it was like but it was like like uh. <laughs> they I know like they acknowledge him being mentally ill and I'm glad that did elicit sympathy but like this much sympathy I I don't know I don't know like as a mentally ill person if I broke and started killing people like don't feel pity for me yeah I murdered people. Don't feel pity for me. Yeah, and there are a lot of steps before that. Yeah. Choices you have to make before that. You know, and like, I don't know. 
I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it. It feels icky. It feels bad. It and feels I don't know like, if I can quite put into words why it feels bad, but it just feels bad. It feels bad. It feels bad. It feels like they're saying his trauma gave him a mental illness. Like, like his trauma made him OCD. His trauma like made him Like he was fine feel... before his parents got killed. Yeah, and then he was... He snapped, quote He's... unquote. Yeah, I don't like the snapping. I don't, I... I don't like the I was fine and then I had one bad experience. A very bad now one. Now I will murder but... people. Yeah, I don't like that they do that. You know? We didn't even get a most mentally ill people are less violent than non men We didn't even get the nod to that. It was just straight up We didn't up even get like, their normal, yeah, we didn't get their normal thing of like. Especially because they didn't know like about the mental illness until like the end of the episode. So it's not like we need to help this guy. He's having a break and it's turning out like this. You know, it was literally like, fuck this guy. He's just being a vigilante. Hate this guy. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. His parents died? That's really sad. Two years ago? That's really sad. You know, it was just like... It's just fucking weird. It's like they needed a reason he was suddenly doing this and it was a mental break. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like it at all. I think... I think this case could have been really interesting. This killer could have been interesting in the way, especially with all the allusions to justice, they could have had a really good, like, law versus justice moment. And instead, they were like, "Mm, but what if he had a mental breakdown and then started murdering people? Like, if he... I just don't like that. I think that's the part that, like, gets me. It's like, that's not fucking justice at all. It's not justice on any part. Not justice for anyone. And so that's why it felt especially unearned. Okay, here's the last part of that episode, by the way. Hodge and Gideon try and talk this dude down. Gideon puts away his gun and moves to, like, try and disarm the guy. Um... The guy points his gun out at Gideon like he was going to give it up, but he's also still pointing it with like his hand on the trigger. Yeah. Um, and then Hot shoots him. There's there are a couple of interesting things here that I do want to point out in this mm-hmm. sequence. So mm-hmm. the guy's on the floor cradling Ted. He keeps like stroking his head with his gun. It's fucking weird. Which is like he's like kind of like tenderly holding him while also like being terrible and then Gideon keeps hinting for Ted to lie and say that he was lying but like the strength it takes an abuse victim and I you know again murder bad but the strength it takes for an abuse victim to stand up to their abuser and then to go to court and say no I was being abused I defended myself and then to have Gideon be like just lie real quick if you could just, just take just all of that back. Me. Just lie for me like one second here. If yeah, you could just lie for me. Just take all of that back. Like like, like for that guy, for a black man who killed someone to mm-hmm. go through and, and stick with his truth and to, and to not be put in prison for it. Like that means something. Mm-hmm. That must have been so hard to go through that. You know, like, one, you you are an orphan, even if your parents were abusive. Now you're something an orphan. You know, we don't know about any siblings. Probably could have been all alone in jail be, after being abused for years. You know, people trying to make you seem crazy and aggressive and all of those stereotypes. And then, and you make it through that. And you have a good life and you're happy. And then someone says, hey, if real quick, you could just pretend like all that shit people said was true though was true and you did just lie like that's terrible that really and also this dude got fucking shot in the chest i'm not gonna ask that man to do shit right now he's dying any little like oh gideon i had i was like fuck you like that is so fuck you for that this dude is barely lucid and you're like, hey, can you lie for me about this very traumatic experience for you please the guy keeps saying no it was real I'm not lying. Like, 
clearly that guy was like, he had done his work, you know, his brain work. And he was yeah. not going back. And like, God, I love that for him. Talk about side characters who are way more interesting <laughs> than, the, <laughs> than the main people. Yeah. And then the guy says like, I'm killing to silence the voices. And I thought it was really interesting that like Hodge and Gideon were both like, this isn't going to stop the voices. Like what? Why would the voices stop? Like they're going to come back and they start like listing crimes and like this happened and this happened. Like you're never, and Gideon says like, you're never going to, you can never murder enough to catch up to all the crimes. The injustice of the world. Right. And I thought that was an interesting sentiment. Like, especially like from the people whose job it is to like catch bad guys, you know, like Mm -hmm. no matter how many bad guys, and this comes up a lot in Criminal Minds, no matter how uh, many bad guys you catch, there are always more. There are 15 seasons of bad guys, right? And that barely scratches the surface. I think that those are some of the most unnerving episodes of Criminal Minds for me are the ones where it's always like, and at the end, here's another bad guy, the cycle starts again, or like. One episode that does fuck me up a lot with this concept is Mm. the episode in Kansas City in the like saw esque like meat packing plant. No, oh oh, no, no. the one where the homeless people have to like run through the like basically saw fucking thing. Um, Terrible. And at the very end, you see all of the pairs of shoes. Oh fuck that! That like the light illuminates Uh. all of the pairs of shoes of the people who died going through this. Yes, and then like at the end of the fucking um canada slash uh detroit one where it's like all those fucking yeah the pig farm with all the shoes that fucks me up like we're never gonna know the full scope of how many people died at the hands of x serial killer or y serial killer we're never gonna know how many fucking serial killers are out there there's just a bunch of people the shoes things this might be a me thing but growing up in miami has a large jewish population and so every year I think October is Holocaust Remembrance Month. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's October. But every year we would study the Holocaust and there was always that picture of the fucking shoes. Mm -hmm. You know? And so whenever I see like one of these episodes, it's just got the pile of shoes. It's just like a trigger memory, you know? Like instinctively, you're just like, you know, because you don't know if every pair of shoes is actually a pair, if they're all single shoes or like, you know, it's just like how many people and something like so sim- as simple as shoes, you know, it always fucks me up. Um, no, the one that gets me with the reoccurring is the one with the little kids. We won't spoil too much. Um, but the one where like the guy has to pick out his future wife. They like cl- yeah, that they one, claim. That one is so fucked up. Yeah. And they like catch the like thing and it's like, don't tell them about your brothers. And it yeah. ends with just like another little boy, you know, and you're just like, there is no way. Like you can stop a million single crimes. But you have no way of knowing if they're part of like a larger picture, like that kind of shit, you know. So I and then I, mm-hmm. oh, the other one that fucks me up the most is anyone that ends with like a highway, like a highway serial killer. Ugh. The trucker ones, yeah, those always fuck me up the most because then you see some girl hitchhiking in with another, yeah, trucker, and you're like, well, well, <laughs> we'll see how this turns out in seven seasons. See if we get back to it. Bet we won't. Like, bet we won't. <laughs> The number of episodes Criminal Mind does where it's like, this is a setup. And then they just like, don't. No, but bring it also up just like the amount of times that they say there, the amount of times that they say and elaborate on the fact that there are more bad guys than anybody can catch. There are more serial killers going on than you even dream to know about. Yeah. Right. Like there is no way that you can catch up and you can't catch them all. Like yeah. that's... The fact yeah. that they're saying this in fucking episode 17 of their yeah. show is bonkers. Yeah, and so even though they aren't, even though that isn't like a moment when like, you know, no one on the team actually like reflects on that, I think it's interesting that they're already bringing up that kind of the concept. Because we said that's kind of like the question that Criminal Minds asks, right? Of like, mm-hmm. does the, like, does the, does doing good outweigh the personal cost of doing that good? You know, and I, it feels like that's this episode is like, you know, they're kind of realizing that's what their like moral of the show is going to be, you know? Yeah. And I think it's good that they found something like this this early on. 
So I can't yeah. imagine going through more than one season with a show that didn't know what its moral was. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think this is yeah, this is where we start to see like Gideon and Hotch both being like, I love this job, but like at what cost? My family, my mental health, my, you know, in for some of them, their physical health, like, like doing this job is unsustainable. And they've already been like hinting at it. And also like, okay, but for, for a crime serial in season one to set up the idea that this job is unsustainable. W- wild. What other I show think. is doing that? I like, just like, I yeah, just the fact that they're literally like, there will come a point when each one of us will break. You know? And, and like, they're right. And they fucking, they set that promise up and they do it. Everybody. And I have a lot to say about the way Criminal Minds handles their team's trauma. But like, yeah, and like L, the L spends this whole season trying to be like, guys, this is unsustainable. Like, guys, like we're not going to be able to handle this. You know, they s- try to make the characters humans. Yeah, it feels less like here are some people that stand in for the larger police force. You know, and more like people are trying their best in a corrupt system. But also, we love the government, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hit or miss sometimes. Um, all right. That's about uh, it, isn't it? Then there's Hallelujah yeah, when the Todd shoots the thing. guy. There's, oh, and there, there are two end quotes. There are. The I duality make... of man. Yeah. Um, the duality of Gandhi is a terrible person. Um, I didn't write, like, the actual quotes, but Gideon's is basically, like, Gandhi said, if you have violence in your heart, be violent. It's better to, like live your truth than to be like peaceful and lie or something and then Hotch says Gandhi also said and then that quote is like if you're like violent you may end up doing more harm than good so Mm -hmm. you know make choices that are going to be the right choice and not just your own needs essentially which I thought was interesting. Like, there's our tiny little contemplation about what the episode is about. Like, do we, are we, are we responsible for being authentic, even when that authenticity is going to hurt people and cause harm? Or do we need to put our community first and suppress certain aspects of ourselves for the sake of the greater good. Do I think this episode earned that question? No. Absolutely fucking not. It did not. Not by a long shot. It's a good question. This episode didn't earn it. It's not it. It's not it. I I don't... Yeah. I don't like those ending quotes. I don't like either of them in relation to what the episode was about, which is that sort of question of law versus justice. And right. this just seems like a weird pivot. Little fumble at the one yard line there. Yeah, I don't know like what they thought they were doing. Like it really seemed at the end that it was about like um it was about being true to yourself and like this guy's true to himself was a murderer. When, like, that wasn't what it was about. Yeah, I don't know. They just, like, the whole episode, you're right. It was about law versus justice. Is Does, does justice belong in the hands of the people? Or are laws always going to provide the correct justice? That's kind of what the episode was about. And then at the end, it was, like, actually... Some of us express our emotions in violent ways, and like that's fine because we're human. It's like it's like, but also consider violence. Mm. And then that was like it. They were like, consider violence. I think you know. I will say that like one thing that's really interesting about Criminal Minds is like, for the most part, we end the episode with like, this is the unsub. This is the guy who did it. And we're going to assume that once he's caught, he's gone forever. 
mm-hmm. you know and so i i wonder if they just like didn't want to open up that door and like they didn't want to ask that question because once they ask that question the it becomes like what about all those people we've caught and put away what if their sister don't doesn't testify what if they are given an alibi what if someone turns on them like like the um the episode with the guy who had those religious delusions and his mother was like very rich woman like that guy didn't serve any time yeah like we know that she was rich as hell and he could plead insanity like that guy didn't serve any time you know and i don't think the show wanted to kind of open that door to we are now going to have to justify the means of capture we are now going to have to prove that they went away for it you know i also think it was weird that they ended this episode on those two quotes and then the the interviews with new yorkers because that to me also implied that this guy wasn't technically quote-unquote gone for good because people believed in him and his message yeah hosh made him a martyr Hotch made him a martyr and like some of those New Yorkers were like yeah I mean he was doing what everybody wishes they could do yeah yeah I when Hotch killed him I was like uh, well I thought the sniper killed him but I was like I thought the message was going to be the police killed the man who was doing their jobs for them yeah uh but no but it, was, it not, was Hotch that was not the message it was Hotch it was Hotch who was we're kind of led to believe not wanting this to become another Iowa, not letting he, him potentially yeah. get out and do more crimes. Yeah, which like, um, I don't know. I'm I don't know sure like, about that one, bud. I think it's one of those things where, like, you know, the show wants us to feel like these are good. I mean, I keep calling them cops, um, but these are like good agents, you know, like good these federal are, agents, good GM. Yeah, these aren't the guys that are corrupt and doing this and doing that like these are the the good ones who catch the bad guys you know and like so when Hotch has a moment of honestly a moment of weakness where he Mm -hmm. kills someone to ease his own conscience we have to trust that that was the right decision and it wasn't the show didn't end didn't earn this episode did not earn its no hallelujah ending song it did not it didn't it didn't earn what it had. Man, last episode was the fucking Coldplay ending. And this now episode we have is this Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just This episode, yeah. man. What the fuck? What the fuck? Yeah. I didn't. Okay, let's rate it. I give it a three. Let's three? Okay. I'll go with you and give it a three. Um they didn't say wheels up, did they? Imagine if they say it at the finale of season one. Imagine if that's the first time they say wheels up. Imagine. So I was rewatching season two this weekend and today. And Morgan does say wheels up in 221. I hope that's not the first time. It cannot be the first time with the way he just threw it out there. Yeah. No, it wasn't 221. It was 218. He went. I don't know. I guess it's wheels up. And he just like went in and left. So that cannot be the first time they say it. So it has to happen before 218. <laughs> but it does not happen between 210 and 218. So it happens between 117 and 210. They do have to say wheels up at least once. Unless that that throwaway, like, I don't know, wheels up is the first time they fucking say it. Which honestly is such a criminal minds thing to do. Nearly at the end of season two would be the first time they say it. No, I can't. No, no it's no, not. I believe no. in their ability to say it sometime <laughs> before that. Yeah. That's all for this episode of Wheels Up, a Criminal Minds fan cast. Next week, oh, we get to a good one. Next time on Wheels Up, we get to season one, episode 18, Somebody's Watching. Oh, which one's that one? Uh, Stalker Case in L.A with Reed. Yeah. Yeah. I have so much to say say about that episode. Yep. That's that's that episode. I'm very excited for it. Jay is too. That will be 
next time on Wheels Up. Until then, please, if you'd be so kind as to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, that does help us out a lot. You can also find us everywhere at Wheels Up Pod on social medias. Jay, give me an outro. Give me an intro. As, as Penelope Garcia says, oh, baby girl, just say no. I did. I didn't like this episode. <laughs> I didn't like this episode either. She like, like found out she found out Rachel was like a drug addict and went, Oh baby girl, just say no.